Coming up next, The Crunch with Cam Slater. Conversations with a side of controversy. Every Thursday from 4 p.m. right here on RCR. Reality Check Radio. People are struggling to have conversations and connect with others that they don't completely agree with on every topic. And I think that's probably the biggest problem that we need to try and solve is how after all this division and after all this separation, do we end up bringing people together again? And what does unity really look like? New Zealand faces some pretty big issues. First one is COVID in the aftermath. There's no getting away from that. Second is racial division. It's being ginned up and it's dangerous. Another issue that maybe people haven't got their head around yet is digital currency. What form does that take? Is it programmable? Will it be used to manipulate behaviour and patterns of behaviour? Those questions need to be asked and answered. How can you have fair, open, democratic government by people who are appointed? It's a ridiculous idea. And if that idea is taken to its zenith, then this country is in real trouble because democracy, one person, one vote, where every vote is of equal value, has got to be the foundation of a modern New Zealand. What's true, what's not true, how our kids are to be educated. And, you know, I have a great fear for the future. I think we know from history where this could end up. This is The Crunch with Cam Slater. Conversations with a side of controversy, right here on RCR. Welcome to The Crunch on Reality Check Radio. I'm your host, Cam Slater, and this is the place where we crunch the political issues and cut through the politician's spin. There's something different for you again this week. First, it's catch-up time with Shane Jones. He's a minister these days, so it'll be short and sweet. But as usual, I expect Shane to deliver some zingers. And then I'll chat with Annie O'Brien about free speech and the turf wars and anything else that takes our fancy. And of course, we'll have the mailbag to get your feedback. And then we'll close out the show with Cam's buddies and see what they think about the government moving to outlaw gang patches. Don't forget to send your comments to inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. Today we're delving into a topic that seems to be echoing the American political landscape, making its presence known right here in New Zealand. I'm talking about the influx of what mainly the media and left-wing commentators call dark money into our election campaigns. Now, we all know that elections in the United States are often characterized by big money. But what may surprise you is that the bulk of these funds doesn't come from political parties or candidates themselves. Instead, it's special interest groups running their own campaigns to influence the outcome of the election. Now, they call these political action committees or PACs for short. And it appears that this trend is seeping into our own political arena as outlined in a recent article by Bryce Edwards. Unfortunately, Bryce is prone to left-wing slants on things, and so he calls this dark money. Edwards highlights how, as rules have tightened around political donations to candidates and parties, the money is finding its way to less regulated and less transparent special interest groups. He and other critics label this as dark money because it operates outside the traditional party system making it harder for officials in the public to scrutinise. But here's the rub. It's perfectly legal. And this is, in reality, a bunch of sour grapes from folks who lost the election and are seeking to blame everyone else rather than have a moment of self-reflection and discover that maybe, just maybe, they lost a contest of ideas because their ideas sucked. In the 2023 general election, we saw a significant surge in third-party spending. While some of it must be declared, the majority maintains managers to maintain below the reporting threshold. The top spenders include groups like Vote for Better Limited, 
New Zealand Taxpayers Union, and surprisingly, even the New Zealand Council of Trade Unions. Yes, you heard that right. Even the unions, traditionally seen as champions of workers' rights, are now involved in significant third-party spending. You won't hear that being called dark money, though. Oh, no, just those who campaigned against the last government. The article does shed light on the top spenders, revealing a mix of socially and fiscally conservative lobby groups. And there's nothing wrong with that. And we know about these people because it is declared as required by law. It's not dark money. It's just money. Just like there is no such thing as dirty politics. It's just politics. Those calling this dark money are seeking to stop people engaging. It's a way of silencing people. It's censorship. Bryce Edwards even uses labels like mysterious to describe people who we actually know. Take the so-called mysterious Vote for Better group. It's led by businessman Tim Barry from the horse racing industry, and they were the biggest spenders. Following closely was the New Zealand Taxpayers Union, known for its anti-government campaigns, and of course the CTU, which ran an attack campaign against Christopher Luxon. Now, as we navigate through this landscape of increased third-party spending, questions arise about the sources of funding and potential hidden influences. Farah Hancock's investigation for Radio New Zealand delves into the possibility of some groups engaging in astroturfing, essentially passing off well-funded campaigns as grassroots movement. But so what? It's their own money or the money of their members. The commentators see this as concerning. But why? Think about that for a minute. They use this language because they don't like it. And so it's mysterious. It's dark money. It's concerning. And none of that is actually true. They say that it's only pushing big money into these more obscure groups, allowing them to operate without disclosing their funding sources. Well, I ask you, why on earth would you want to donate to a candidate or a party, have that disclosed, and then have the media disparage you for spending your own money and smear you for doing so? Bryce Edwards' article quotes Greg Presland of the Labour Party, drawing attention to the lack of obligation for these groups to disclose who is funding them. The concerns extend to the possibility of overseas entities influencing our elections without actually producing any evidence that there are any overseas entities influencing our elections. And of course, they neglect to mention that overseas individuals and organisations are not allowed to donate to political parties or candidates. But Greg Presland, who's a lawyer from West Auckland, knows that. So it's just a smear because his team lost. And it doesn't end there. So-called investigative reports by Jonathan Milne at Newsroom apparently shed light on how big corporations, like a mining company, influenced election races. I say so-called because Jonathan Milne, all he has done is look up publicly available information as required by law, donations, returns, and then ascribe nefarious implications against the donors. People like Bryce Edwards, Greg Presland, and Jonathan Milne and Farah Hancock claim we need more transparency without even realising that if it wasn't for transparency of donation laws, they'd never have the names and the donors to moan about in the first place. This is all legal. There's nothing untoward about this. It is just caterwauling from a bunch of losers. Thanks for joining me on looking into this world of political spending and so-called dark money. Stay informed, stay engaged, and as always, keep questioning. Shane Jones is back on the crunch. A lot has happened since his last appearance, including Ratana, Waitangi, and of course stuff attacking ministers like Shane for daring to engage with Reality Check Radio. Shane will undoubtedly deliver some good zingers, which will keep all our social media team busy making shareables. Shane's on the line from the Beehive now. Welcome back to The Crunch, Shane Jones. Uh, good to have you back here again. I think the last time we spoke was just before Christmas, wasn't it? Yes. No, uh, you've got me here in Wellington. Today the House will be sitting, and it's a pleasure to engage uh, Yeah, yet again. Well, it's interesting because uh, Tuesday uh, morning, Glenn McConnell, the 
stuff reporter wrote an article about this shock horror ministers of the government are engaging in and be, being interviewed by reality check radio it's got some sort of grand conspiracy um what what are your thoughts on his little episode and rant well look i um uh, it was uh, my attention was directed towards it um it must be a slow news day it ought not to be a matter of newsworthiness when a politician talks to a whole host of um uh, media oriented outlets. I mean, people are consuming their information in such different ways today. But there's a narrative uh, that's alive and well and kicking, and it's driven in many respects by wokeism. And I'll give you one small example. Hmm. The notion that um, my colleague Casey Costello should hold back on prosecuting the legislation through the House to overturn those awkward and totally unnecessary and quite destructive uh, changes to uh, to smoking law driven by the Labour Party over the last couple of years. And that mm. should be put on the tai ho until such time the Waitangi Tribunal feasts at the trough of judicial activism. Now, I was really disappointed that that narrative has been perpetuated by the media. The Waitangi Tribunal is a recommendatory body. Mm. And we had a mandate given to us by the electorate to change smoking laws uh, laws, I might say, have never, ever actually been implemented. So that's a tiny example where we feel that there are no shortage of people trying to leg trip uh, what we conceive to be our democratic mandate to get certain things changed and underway. It's like the, the mainstream media. I mean, they were bleating to to the politicians a couple of weeks ago about how dreadful it is that they've got competition and it's awful and please can you regulate the space and tilt the playing field in their favour. Uh, again, that's another piece of Labour legislation that Willie Jackson, who should know better about media matters, um, has been pushing through. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I saw that they were at the uh, Select Committee. Well, look, um, in terms of the overarching approach to New Zealand First, uh, no one has articulated it more lucidly um, than Winston Peters in terms of um, the the ups and downs and the disappointments and the frustrations that we've had during the three-year period that we were banished from Parliament and the scant coverage that our party received from, uh, so said, uh, Fourth Estate. Yeah, particularly Stuff uh, and Glenn McConnell. He seems to have a running battle with Winston. I'm not sure he's ever going to win that battle with Winston. Winston's far too cunning to... To, to oh, do well, that. Over the, yeah, over the years, I've watched heaps of Junos um, square up against Winston, and uh, obviously my loyalty is with my leader, and um, he knows how to deal with the, the different uh, verbal sword plays that emerge from time to time when he's dealing with the media. The thrust, though, seems to be from Glenn McConnell's article is how dare ministers speak to other media other than us. Mm, which mm. is rather arrogant of, of him. I mean, Reality Check Radio is grateful to stuff for promoting the station and, and that ministers come on like yourself and talk to us. So I thought David Seymour's comment about he talks to anybody, even niche players like stuff was hilarious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, uh, Look, I've learned to my cost, mate, if you get too hung up on the personality of the journal, then that becomes somewhat obsessive. I just... I just shrug my shoulders. It is what it is. And as you know, I've come off second best in various blows with people in the fourth estate. But uh, the, the the market and the landscape is inordinately different than when I first washed up in politics in 2005. But then, as you'd know, mate, I was already active as the chairman of the Māori Fisheries Commission, along with Sir Tipene O'Regan, and have our big blows way back then. Mm. Mm. So, uh, no, no, I'll leave the young fella to his own um, peregrinations. And uh, I know that Rangatira Winston Peters is more than capable of looking after himself. Exactly. Now, just touching on that smoking legislation, they seem to be saying that uh, it's harmful to Maori that you've changed the legislation. The logical extension of that, the absurd logical extension is that of that, uh, because I understand a couple of them are thinking of taking the case to the Waitangi Tribunal about it, about the detrimental effects of smoking on Maori, is that they're almost wanting you to say, well, if you're Maori, no cigarettes for you. Yeah, look, the, this thing gathered a lot of steam and, and momentum in the days of um, Tariana Turia, 
Mm. And uh, I think you'll find that there probably already is an action um, that's been advanced to the Waitangi Tribunal. But we can't overlook the fact that uh, Maori smoking rates have dropped markedly in the more recent um, period of our history. And there are some good things that did flow from um, helping people um, beat the habit. But at the end of the day, there's a thing called human agency as well. And um, I just don't think that you can ever strip uh, Māori, Pākehā, Asian, Black, Blue, Brindle, whatever, wh whatever group you want to focus on, mate. Mm. Uh, there's a thing called free will. And that goes right back to the stories about humanity in the Bible. And uh, there's no way our party is ever going to agree with some sort of blanket regulation uh, uh, we make, um, if you're of Maori descent, you make smoking illegal. Anyway, the, these rules that we're changing, it would have led for the gangs being in control of the cigarette industry, anyhow. Well, totally. I mean, you've got a, a situation now, you know, laughably, where tobacco is actually more expensive than cannabis. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, and so you're almost saying to the gangs, hey, guys, uh, transition out of cannabis and into tobacco. Mm. You know, and, and you know that I remember giving a presentation to a select committee back in Honey Harawera's day. Uh, he actually threatened to thump me at the select committee meeting. It was held at Alexandra Park, and I was talking about uh, back then the numbers of smokers that we had, and we'd had ten years of you know, a huge amount of money spent on smoking cessation programs. And I asked the, the committee how many smokers were there 10 years ago and how many were there now, and the answer was almost exactly the same within you know, rounding figures. And I said, well, why have we spent all that money? What, what, what has mm. it achieved, right? Mm. And, um, and I said, you're running the risk of heading down the path of Bhutan, which uh, increased taxation on cigarettes to such an extent that it became very, very lucrative to import black market tobacco, and it, and it leapt out of control. And... You know, we're seeing that now in New Zealand where the taxes are so extreme on on tobacco products that um, it's, it's worth your while to try and slip a few containers through some of the lesser known ports in New Zealand and import, uh, you know, duty-free, uh, essentially, tax evasion uh, of cigarettes. And then they sell them to the poorest people in New Zealand. You know, on the question of the gangs, obviously our colleague, the Minister of Police, is bringing forward a bill mm. to... Um, uh, make it illegal for the public exposure of gang patches, and part of it, I presume, is based on the West Australian experience. Mm. It's going to take a while for that type of regime to bed in, um, and there were some predictable um, combustible responses from Oportiki where one bloke about my age um, threatened it would lead to war, which is an absolute overreaction and nonsense. Mm. But... The in areas where we hail from, not very far from Kaikohe, my mum lives in Awanui, not far from Kaitaia. Mm. The real problem we're dealing with is that there is a subculture in each of the generations, and it's getting harder and more intransigent to break into. Mm. That is at one level very anti community, anti social, but it's doing no end of harm to both the children and the wives of that um, gang subculture group. So that, that's the reason why New Zealand First has always been a, an enthusiast um, for policies of this nature. Now, we know that uh, the majority of the people can come into the world of light, and we need some disruptiveness. And I just wonder if too many of the um, gang-related people got let out of prison or given an option to serve their sentence in the community, and um, they've continued to... I don't know, mobilize, recruit, because uh, gang members membership has gone up. It's uh, not exclusively um, in my area, in the Ngāpuhi Nuitonu area. It's amongst the PI community and uh, other elements, and I'm sure that uh, within the ethnic communities there's gang formation as well. But we're solidly behind what the Minister of Police is rolling out in and trying to do there, mate. Well, you've got to try and do something. I mean, the previous uh, uh, government seemed to have a policy of cuddling up to particularly the mongrel mob. Um, but, you know, you, you can see the impact of this crime in society because even at Waitangi Day, 
amongst members of the various haka parties that were performing, there was a, a plethora of ankle bracelets. And it's a tragedy, you know, that there's all these people that are out there with ankle bracelets on for committing crimes. Okay, they're, they're uh, participating in cultural activities and those sorts of things, but they've still got this, you know, bracelet on their ankle that everyone can see. It's it's, it's also an embarrassment, really, that, that we've yeah. got this situation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's disproportionately prevalent in pockets of the community that um, – that uh, I'm in regular contact with. I, I would say, you know, what, what does a community do? You, you really want to uh, get people to accept their consequences for your actions, but come back into the world of light. That's that and agency it, discussion that we were having it, earlier, isn't it? It, it? There's no way of getting away from that. And at the end of the day, it's um, not only by the sweat of thy brow, but it's free will as well. Mm. So, look, the party's had a hard line in that regard. Derek Ball, currently the manager of the leader's office. He was previously an MP. He he drove that, um, mm. rode that horse really hard. And um, in an earlier time, Winston and I came up with various policies to get these men with they're coming out of prison straight into work. And in the vast majority of the cases, it worked. But there's always going to be a small element that are backsliders, and we need to ensure that the consequence of those actions are visited upon them, which is not pleasant for their kids or wives, but but it's very corrosive uh, for the broader community unless we draw the line and say, sorry, bro, you go over that line, you're off to the hinaki. And hinaki, by the way, is the Maori word for jail, but it's also the word for the eel pot. The eel goes in, but the eel never gets out until the door is open. See, that's the thing, isn't it? Most people in society actually believe that you commit a crime, you should go to prison. And mm. and, and, and it's not about rehabilitation. It's about get, removing them from society. And particularly mm. violent criminals, you know. mm. Mm. but but mm. petty crime leads to you know other crimes over and over again. Mm. The, the evidence is is clear there. Mm. Mm. I'll tell you a challenge that we've got going up north. What I mean, it's the state highway. Is how long it takes in New Zealand to damn well get things done. Oh, it's terrible. Uh, I mean, it's uh, it's an indictment. I mean, we meant well. We are a first world nation, and long may that prevail. But in order for that status to continue to be bequeathed by my generation to another generation or our generation to future generations, we need to be raising our economic surplus at each and every step of the journey. And um, I, I'm horrified how the people that are dominating the um, climate change agenda seem to have disconnected their demands for reform from the capacity of the economy to bear the costs of reform. Now, I don't want to sound too pointy-headed, but if you continue to gut the $85 billion worth of export revenue that comes from predominantly our commodities and our primary industry, mm. where's the income going to come from? And how come um, we don't even see in many cases or hear in many cases the business leadership themselves pointing out that there's a cost to imbibing the um, the you know the green climate change woke Kool-Aid if you haven't got an economic plan as to how you're going to meet the costs of this transition. So I tend to be pretty dismissive of a lot of our business leaders who start to warble on in that regard when they themselves privately know that a business and a firm and an economy can only change at a certain pace or you're going to destroy the capacity of the economy to yield and generate the revenue that the society needs to afford first world accoutrements. Yeah, and then there's the allegations that are most frequently hurled at uh, people like yourself in New Zealand First, and and I see Bryce Edwards is on a bandwagon again, as are most of the media talking about what they call dark money uh, in politics, so third party advertising during elections and things like that. Um, it the the words they use make it sound like it's subversive and awful, and then they, all the examples they use uh, tend to be business related um, lobbying that's going on. But forget that the CTU, for example, was the third largest third party lobbyist or advertiser in the last election. It's again, I think you never hear these discussions when there's a Labour government in, but as soon as you get a centre right government in that's challenging wokeism and all these things, 
they all of a sudden say, oh, it's the dark money of the Atlas Network or it's the dark money of the cigarette, big tobacco or the dark money of big food, and they go on and on and on about dark money. It's not really an issue, is it? Yeah, well, I mean, I um, attracted about $95,000 odd thousand dollars, um, in um, donations, which all of which were um, disclosed, and much of which the vast majority of which got used in order to meet the costs associated with our party because an individual candidate can only spend somewhere between 27 and 30K, some yeah, bigger like yeah, yeah. But um, that type of coverage causes people to lose courage and want to donate to campaigns or donate to individuals. Mm. And, it does, and, and if you don't come from stupendous wealth, it doesn't make it very difficult to run and sustain uh, the costs of a campaign. So, I'm, I mean, I'm incredibly um, respectful of the people who have shown generosity to have met the costs associated with us coming back into power. Uh, our, our party will never agree with the green approach, which is to get the taxpayers to pay for the costs of political parties running campaigns. Um, that will cause uh, our party and other parties to be to fall under the um, predatory gaze of the bureaucracy, and that's something we're just never ever going to do. So we are reduced to being innovative and identifying people or interests who are willing to back the narrative of our party. All of which is all of which is legal, mate, and that needs to be constantly reinforced. And that's the thing; it is legal. Uh, this the systems have been set up and passed by MPs, and the system is is behaving as it was intended to. We've got political disclosure, we've got donations that are disclosed, we've got all of these sorts of things happening. I remember having a discussion with Mike Williams, the former president of the Labour Party. You know, the, the man who spent a whole lot of money going over to Australia to dig dirt on John Key with the H fee, telling me that he was lobbying as hard and as loud as he could for taxpayer funding of political parties because then he didn't have to go and do fundraising. And I thought, <laughs> well, that says it all. Oh, you know? Yeah, well, they're, they're, yeah, I mean, uh, it, more recently, I think it's James... Um, but, I mean, the Green Party have suffered a few blows. And, um, I, I mean, obviously it's a tragic event with uh, Festival Collins. Mm. Uh, Festival himself, however, never really made his mark in Parliament. He made his mark up in the community, on the sidewalks, and in the hard-to-enter um, places in South Auckland, and all power to his arm. But that aside, there have been some big changes in the Green Party, and uh uh, Labor's got a hell of a challenge in front of us because it will bleed some vote as Chloe weaves her magic amongst a, a younger generation. But more importantly, Labor, and it's not my um, it's not my wish that they succeed, but they've got to redefine why they exist. What's the purpose of their political movement? And they've long since departed from the interests of blue collar working families. And much of the support that Winston attracted in our recent campaign, it, it wasn't just from my generation up, and I'm born in 1959, so do the maths yourself, but it was also from working families who feel that they no longer have a voice because their voices are not refined by woke politics, identity politics. Um, they just don't live like that, and they don't have that level of. Um, it's a type of political sophistication if you work in that, if you live in that sort of glitterati world. They're just bog standard Kiwis getting on with life and want to make sure that someone's going to address the day to day burdens that um, they grind away with trying to uh, live with. It's the problem, isn't it, with the Labour Party in particular, but also the Green Party, is they've become a liberal elite, you know, driven by this ESG. You know, everyone, uh, every little uh, microcosm of society has to be, uh, you know, looked after. We've got rainbow ticks. We've got all this sort of nonsense. I always go back to when I was running a bit of a roading crew in Man in the old Manukau city, and we had a, a new guy came in. He was a, a Pakia. Uh, the other three guys that were working in the roading crew were Maori, and and he was being a little bit, you know, untoward. And uh, the boss of the of the roading gang came up to me and says, mate, this is getting untenable. What should we do about it? And I said, well, how do you want to sort it out? He says, I want to give him the end of the pick handle. I said, well, <laughs> maybe the pick handle is probably not appropriate, but 
Uh, how about you sort it out um, out on the job today and then give me a report back? Well, it was sorted out at the back of the truck in time-honoured fashion between blokes, and that was the end of the problem. These well, days, well. you know, you'd have uh, all sorts of reports that had to be filled in and health and safety stuff would just be ridiculous. And we've kind of got moved away from all of that robust Kiwi way of dealing with things and gone to this woke, as you say, wokeism um, mm. method of dealing with things, which doesn't actually solve any problems. Yep. Well, on the question of moving on and uh, retaining my earthy qualities, I've got to check out, uh, buddy. No, I've that's right. It was always going to be and, a short uh, Someone poked their head into my office and said, Matua Shane, you're running late. So uh, we'll have a corridor again in the near future and um, kia kaha to all your listeners and uh, great to uh, engage. See thank you later. You, thank you for your time, Shane. All right, kakete. Told you there'd be some zingers. Shane Jones sure isn't backing down and neither is Winston Peters in their war on woke and dodgy media. Shane's promised to check in regularly, if only to annoy Glenn McConnell at Stuff. Tell me your thoughts on what Shane had to say by emailing inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. This is The Crunch with Cam Slater. Conversations with a side of controversy right here on RCR. Annie O'Brien comes from a digital marketing background and recently spent a year working in Parliament for the Leader of the Opposition as the Director of Digital. She's been heavily involved in women's rights advocacy and is a founding council member of the Free Speech Union. She joins me on the line now. Annie O'Brien, welcome to The Crunch. It's good to have you on Reality Check Radio. I think this is your first Reality Check Radio appearance. It is. Thank you. It's um, (laughs) it's good to be chatting with you. Now, you're involved with the Free Speech Union Mm -hmm. um, and a couple of other activities around the place, but I I wanted to touch on the importance of free speech, particularly in some of the key issues that we're seeing arise in New Zealand now and some of the ones in the past where we've seen almost a censorious application about free speech by politicians, by the mainstream media and others, and and why it's so very important to have people like you with voices out there that are saying, no, hang on, you need to hear us. And mm-hmm. I guess I guess the biggest one is at the moment, well, you know, that we saw in the in the past 12 months was the turf wars that that you know I call them the turf wars. And I've had Rachel Stewart on the program and you know, I'm on your side. Here, on this one, right? <laughs> There's men and there's women, right? That's it. There's mm-hmm. no men masquerading as women. That's they're, they're just men in a frock. That's the way I look at it. But mm-hmm. we've got this, we see it in the media, we see it in many of the political parties, this uni thought that it's okay for men to pretend to be women and we can call them women and we can change all our language and everything all around that and actually use the patriarchy, this is what I always say, using the patriarchy to subject women even further Um, because it's men telling women what they can say and think, right? Yeah. It it is the ultimate um, kind of epic move by the patriarchy to to find a way to, I guess, cuckoo bird and get in the nest and say, no, we're the right kind of woman. We're the most woman kind of woman there are. And you other, you know, biological ones, you listen to us um, and and we can tell you how it's got to be. And so it's incredible to me that, you know, for about 10 years now, I've been saying, no, you don't tell me what I can do with my spaces, my sport. Um, you certainly don't put women in more danger in places like prison or um, domestic violence shelters. Um, I'm saying no. And then I look around and there was all these women saying, oh, no, we're fine with that. And I was just like. Aren't they traitors? Uh, yeah, I um, I think there's a, there is a, a mixture. There are some who are what I would call the cool girl. Um, uh, I'm not sure if you've, you've read or seen the movie The um, Gone Girl. There's a monologue in it about the cool girl who says, pick me, I'm different, I, you know, I'm so cool, I'll do yeah. exactly what I want, basically. 
So I think there's an element of that where, especially on the left, you see these women who will sign away every right that we've ever won in order to get a pat on the back. And, by and, the and fought hard for those rights too. I mean, you know, New Zealand is with the first, was the first country uh, that uh, gave women the vote. Exactly. Uh, we, yeah. right? Men already had the vote. So, hmm. you know, yeah. Is, so there's, there's a lot of that um, cool girl stuff. But then I also think that, that fear has been the massive weapon used here. Women tend to be more agreeable because of how we're socialized. Mm -hmm. I missed that lesson, I think. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you and Rachel Stewart. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we both missed that missed lesson. That. You were wagging school that day. Exactly. But the, but on the whole, you know, we're socialised to be more agreeable and to want to be more nurturing and, and loving and those kind of things. And so you find that women are like, oh, you know, these the very um, depressed men who um, think that they're women and we, we should do whatever we can to make them happy and safe and da, da 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 And they really buy into that narrative of, you know, these are the most vulnerable people around because that's what's pushed. And then they're afraid to not acquiesce not go along with it because they'll be called names. They'll be told they're they're bad and they're mean and that they want them to die and all that kind of thing. And so it's really been all the disagreeable women like, like myself who who have said, no, you're not a woman. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, this is the, the thing that fascinates me. We, if you get a nine-year-old come up to you and says, look, Dad, um, I, I want to share a bottle of whiskey with you, get hammered, You'd give them a clip around the ear and send them to their room and said, "Don't be stupid, right?" If they if they came to you and said, "Look, Dad, I'm nine years old. I'm I'm really interested in uh, finding out about sex. Can you take me to the local brothel um, and you know just supervise and everything?" You'd say, "Go to your room. You're grounded." Yeah, no. But but a nine year old comes up and says, "Dad, look, I think I'm a girl. Um, I'm going to start wearing dresses and can I take all of these puberty blockers?" It seems that they go, "Oh, sure, no problem. You know, yeah. we're okay with that." It's it's and incredible. Insane. It's incredibly regressive again, though, because the, the nine year old says to you, "I think I'm a girl." The reason for that is because he probably really likes feminine stereotypical toys and presentation. Um, so he probably likes to play in the same ways that some of the girls in his class play in. And when you when we say as a society, if you want to play with those toys, you have to be a girl. We're telling this this little boy that the only way that he can, you know, play with those toys or like glitter or whatever it is, is if he becomes a girl. When really, I think kids are kids. Just let them play what they want to play with, and generally they their own way, up. won't they? Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. you can't learn to ride a bicycle first time. You you come off, you you get oh. scabbed knees, you stub your toes, you get everything wrong, and in the boy's case, you managed to land on the crossbar, you know, it, it, it's like <laughs> hell, you know. But you learn, don't do that. Um, but my dad bribed me. He bribed me. If I taught myself how to ride my bike, I'd get the Britney Spears CD. Right. So I taught myself how to ride my bike. <laughs> you really wanted that CD, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> you know, you know it's, it's, it's insane what society does and contorts itself. But we, we – I, I'm still gobsmacked by the scenes that we saw uh, when Posey Parker uh, came to New Zealand, where a bunch of angry men, uh, mm -hmm. largely, were physically intimidating a smaller group of women who mm -hmm. just wanted to hear somebody speak. Yeah. Now, you were involved in that, weren't you? Yeah, I was right right in the thick of it. It was, yeah. it was frightening. And... Um, I felt so bad because I'd, I'd had a conversation with Posey the night before and she said, well, like, it's really heating up down there. Like, um, and she said, will the police be okay? And I said, what do, what do you mean, will the police be okay? And she said, are they going to, you know, do you think that they'll, you know, protect us? Mm. And I said, yes, <laughs> because in all my experiences in New Zealand, I've, I was naive enough to think the police show up and protect those who are being attacked or, like, you know, that I just assumed that even if they disagreed with what she had to say, they would protect her against physical attack. Mm. I said that, and then the next day, as this 
group of men, as you say, dismantled a fence and ran at us. And I looked around and there were police nowhere. I just had this dread of like, oh my God, I've given her this false sense of security here. And the reality is that we've been left completely on our own, that they're not here. I ended up ringing 111 from the middle of the melee and got a really shitty um, responder on the, on the phone. Mm. And I was saying, you know, like, there are women trapped in the rotunda and like, I think these men are going to hurt them. Um, And they're being pulled at and pushed. And, um, and the guy on the phone was just like, yeah, we know about it. And I was like, but there's no cops here. And they're like, we've had lots of calls about it. Mm. I was like, well, is anyone coming? Because literally. Yeah. And it was just, the, the private security who were holding the crowd back from Posey, she was getting pulled and pushed. And it was like, it was really primal, some of it. Like, it really scared me because it was the type of thing where, you know, you hear about um, people kind of, or, or like mass hysteria or something where, mm. where a mob kind of gets whipped up into a frenzy. Yeah. And it kind of felt like that because they, they look wild, like, and so I kind of thought, what is the end point of this? If they get to her, are they just, they're going to rip her apart. Yeah, I, like, I know someone who was in that melee with, with you, you know, um, and uh, she, she said she was frightened, frightened yeah. for her life. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, the news media and the police all took the side of, of, yeah. the, of them. Uh, it, it, it was astonishing. I, I was actually um, quite interested on the weekend. I think it was Nicola Willis and, and Luxon were ushered out of the gay out mm. because of the mob there. The Palestinian that was the protesters. Same people, same yeah. people who did that to us. Because there's only a small community of these psychopathic bloody activists, and they were the same ones. They're the same ones who do all the very aggressive Palestine stuff. And what was interesting to me was they were being nowhere near as aggressive as they were towards us. They seemed to be shouting nasty things, but they weren't being physical like they were with us. And Luxon and Willis's police contingent got them out of there. They saw the risk. They saw it was dangerous. They got them out of there. And I kind of, it just made me a bit cross because I was like, every politician from all the different parties said, Oh, yeah, it was mostly mostly peaceful protests. Da, 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 da. It wasn't. It was hugely violent and yeah. aggressive. And a fraction of that happened at Big Gay Out, and they were swept out by police. Yeah. I find it astonishing that politicians pander to these groups. I mean, they do. Yeah. I mean, you see the Green Party especially, right? But mm. but you know, the, the vast majority of people who would have been at the big big gay out or any of these sort of events, they're not national voters. They're not act voters either. So I don't know why David Seymour and Nicola Willis and Chris Bishop and Luxon all go prancing around in their colourful shirts like they care because they don't. Yeah, it's interesting because I think it is fair again. It's the media is hugely plugged into this community. I hate using that because I'm supposedly... Well, it's not a community it. though, is it? No. It's not a community. <laughs> yeah. So my partner and I usually go to Big Gay Out because yeah. it's usually the one that's more chilled. It's usually the one not like the parades and stuff where yeah. it's, you know, yeah. all the telcos and stuff dressed up. Um, usually there's music and drinking and it's quite fun. Um, we didn't go this year and I'm glad we didn't because of the protests and stuff that, that kind of ruined the whole thing. But it is like last year when we went, it was, there was a lot of political stuff. Um, everyone who went on the stage was making political statements about um, Wayne Brown. Yeah. So there was, I think he just kind of floated that he was going to cut um, funding to arts or something. Yeah. And so they were all making a big deal out of it. And what I noticed was these were the people going on the stage. These were the performers and the, the people who organised it. You look around at those sitting on the lawn with us. 
We were all rolling our eyes every time a political statement was made because even though most of them would have been left voters, people are just sick of it being politicised. They just want to, like, get a bit drunk and have a dance, you know? Like, yeah, everything has become this, this absolute political mess. And I almost think we should tell all the politicians to fuck off and not come to these things because why do we want them there? Well, I mean, I don't get it. It's like, you know, did you see News Hub the other night doing this big story about how NZTA or Waka Kotahi had specially bought these vests with no branding and it cost $304. Where are they buying them for? from? <laughs> This is it costs three hundred and four dollars for seventeen of them. They, they 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 cost a Big Mac chips and a Coke, but here's News Hub. That this is exactly what we're talking about. It's a different topic, but it's exactly what we're talking about. We've got News Hub making this big song and dance about three hundred and four dollars. Of course, they never made a song and a dance when um, uh, various different ministers turn up and get given a jacket from Civil Defence or whatever they call themselves. Um, Jacinda Ardern, there's a million photos of her wearing orange vests and yeah. all these day glow things. Same with Christopher but, Hickens. But I'm sitting there thinking, why do they, why do the politicians play dress up? It, it, but there's, there's no safety issues here. The road's been opened or, or <laughs> it's completely devoid of any machinery or anything like that. It's about to have cars roll down it. Um, and they have them all tip up wearing a hard hat, safety glasses, and, and, and a fluoro vest. It, yeah. Isn't that kind of the same as attending Big Gay Out? It's just so they can tick a box to say, look at me, I did this. I think um, it's mostly to do with the media. And I'll use an example of um, when I worked for Judith Collins when she was the leader. Um, so I was travelling with Judith. We were down in Queenstown and we went to, after dinner, me, her... I think Shane Retty was there and Joseph Mooney. We went to get an ice cream after dinner and it was um, still, there was still some COVID restrictions. So we yeah. were wearing masks and whatnot. Literally, we were wearing the masks. Judith stepped forward to collect her ice cream, took her mask off to eat it. Um, and someone, obviously not friendly to her politics, filmed that few mm. seconds. Without the wider context, yep. I then spent that evening on the phone getting all the questions from the journalists, like it was Judith had committed the most massive crime. I'm not sure if you remember, but it was... it was. I, I never wore a news. mask, so I don't know what the fuss is all about. <laughs> it, was, it was all over the news. It was, it was a main story for the next few days, was that she did not put her mask on. And so sometimes these politicians and their staffers are literally just trying to avoid a shitstorm in the media. They're just like, okay, if we do this thing, then it's one thing the media can't blow up. And to be honest, that is more centre right parties. The you know, yeah, I, I doubt that, that, that would have happened to Jacinda. You're never going to see Winston Peters having a thought about that. What if this ends up in the media? He'll be thinking, oh, awesome, it's going to be in the media. <laughs> That's what I want. <laughs> no such thing yeah, as bad news. True. That is true, but I think it is symptomatic of national to to a different extent. Labor, those centre parties are so reliant, or well, they feel they are, on the legitimacy from the media that they tie themselves in knots to try and placate. Now, the problem is, I think that that we need to reassess the, um, I guess, equation there, because we're now in a situation where the six o'clock news is not the be, be all and end all. Um, you know, it used to be you needed to hit, you know, have your press releases out in time for the six o'clock news. You wanted to get those top slots. Yeah, those and those days are done now. Yeah, that's it's done. And so now you've got a whole different set of media, but also you've got the ability to bypass the media, which yep. is you guys are doing with your own new media type, but yep. also social, but also by list building and, and direct emailing. Yes, and which so, is what the which is what the free speech union does, builds those yeah. list emails, emails direct 
bypasses exactly. the media and gets the message that you want out there, not this homogenized, cut down, thirty second soundbite that the media like to to use. Yeah, and I think we're seeing like you, you used Winston as an example, and mm. um, he is showing that it is possible to not play the media game and use your alternative channels to get your message across. I think it could be done better, um, but for what he's trying to achieve, it's working. Now, Luxon is never going to do that because he is down the centre, national, safe, <laughs> if you will. But it's um, not safe, is it? Because you've no. got, you've got, this is, I always hark back, this is a free speech issue. If you've got a media that are hostile, Mm -hmm. They are stifling your views or um, whoever you're representing, in your case, the Mm. Free Speech Union, and the media are deciding we're not going to carry this. Mm. This isn't news. And so they are acting as censors against the message that you're putting out, whether it's um, in terms of free speech, in terms of Pauly Parker or Mm. dissenting views. And I, I I like all views. Right, you you could be completely opposed to my politics, and I'll still defend your right to say whatever you want, no matter how silly it is. That's what we're doing at the Free Speech Union, right? Like the amount of times where we have fronted stuff that we don't agree with, but but you have to, right? You know, for example, and sometimes we deliberately speak on issues that are counter. So I fronted the Bethlehem College stuff because. Mm. I'm gay. And actually, um, you know, I don't disagree with them on everything anyway, but I wanted to to show I can come out here and defend um, Bethlehem College's um, rights to speech and to what they teach. Um, and it shouldn't matter if that is in an alignment with my own views, my own life. Um, likewise, you know, we've, we've got um, Jewish members on our council who have defended the, the Palestinian protesters, um, you know, pro-Palestine rallies and that kind of thing. Yeah. So I think it's actually really important to demonstrate a willingness to stand by the principle uh, rather than um, picking and choosing the issue and then yeah. saying, you know. Free speech is an absolute, isn't it? There's no but after. You know, I believe in free speech. You can't now say but and then mm. add something that, says that you don't believe in free speech. You either do or you don't. And it's quite funny. A lot of people can't grasp the concept. Like often I'll criticise someone um, on Twitter, say, I'll say, you know, that was an appalling thing to say. I've said it about Chloe Swarbrick's um, mm. behaviour at the pro-Palestine rallies. Yeah. I've, I've been very critical of it. And people will say, well, what about her free speech? I'm saying, oh. I'm not impacting her free speech. I'm using she, my own speech. She's allowed to say, to say it, but we're also yeah. allowed to say that that's shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's the thing. It's like I'm I'm not coming for her at all. I'm just saying, well, that's appalling and it has these consequences, mm. you know, challenging her, in which case I've had my free speech to criticise her. She's had her free speech to say shitty slogans and, and that's all good. But people just struggle with the concept and I just find myself having to explain it over and over and over. But well, we've had it here at Reality Check Radio. You know, I interviewed uh, somebody and they had strong views. And they were very polite in the way that like, interviews with me are convivial. Right? They're never mm. hostile. I'm not about trying to bash anybody up, trying to prove a point. I just want to have a conversation. And mm. in having that conversation, we can find out where, where people think or what what direction they're going in. And if you don't mm. have those conversations, you don't find out. But the vitriol that came from that saying, well, you should be saying it from this perspective. You should be doing it from that perspective. Mm. You know, we had on the treaty principles um, issue, we had um, a number of different views from David Seymour to Margaret Mutu to um, a couple of others. And there were people saying, we don't want, we don't want that woman on, on our show. We don't want her saying those things. That, that's appalling. You shouldn't have her on the show. But Reality Check Radio was founded because there literally is no other media out there that lets people have their say, that lets mm. the guests have their say, and that we can impart knowledge and information and then people can decide for themselves whether they like that or don't like that or are ambivalent towards it. And, and, and even so our important. major competitor is hostile 
two particular points of view. And I don't mm. believe that we are. And certainly on my show, I try not to be hostile to particular points of view. I might not agree with somebody, but I want to hear what they've got to say. That, and that's how it should be. I mean, taking that example of the Treaties Principle Bill, the polarisation and toxicity that we've seen before mm. the bill is even written is so concerning. And I lay a lot of the blame at the feet of the media, perhaps even Absolutely. more than politicians, um, because of their framing has created a real fear on one side and anger on the other. These are not good combinations. And no. so I think it is completely responsible to platform people with various views on the subject and allow people to make up their own minds. But also, it would have been amazing if, if it had been made clear that this bill hasn't been written and everyone's kind of talking about these concepts, but we don't know what we're arguing over yet. And I mean, so that's, a, that's the huge thing. I saw all these people at Waitangi talking about how um, David Seymour was going to abolish the treaty and rewrite the treaty. There's Both of those things are lies, yeah. right? What he's saying is there's no principles in the treaty, but we've got laws that say that we have to honour the principles of the treaty. How can we make that happen if we don't know yeah. what the principles are? Let's have a debate. And all hell has broken loose. Absolutely. And they're trying to silence him and silence anybody else who has a differing opinion that of this wonderful woke view that the head of the British Empire, Queen Victoria, in all of her magnificent glory as the Empress of India and everything else, signed a very unique document that was different from every other thing that the British Empire had ever done mm -hmm. and said, you disparate groups of, of various different tribes represented by these senior people are all on a level, same level as me. Mm. Well, well, that's just a heroic assumption to to, to understand that, that that's just not true. You know, you can look well, at that's, that's what I struggle with. I, I mean, I'm undecided to be honest on mm. on the principles bill because I don't know what it'll achieve. But I'll make that decision once I've well, let's seen hear it. The bill and, and you know, however, I do struggle with the a historical narrative that's being woven here. Um, not that I've really used it. I have a degree in history. And so I guess I've spent a lot more time than maybe the average person on these issues because um, I did a bit of New Zealand history. Mm. And it is ahistorical to say that Māori did not give up sovereignty. Now, I can understand why people now would want to, to, to share that view. But you just have to go and read the speeches that were given at Waitangi, which are available online. Do a little Google. You just have to go to read. Um, there was a, a conference in 1860 at Koimarama, mm -hmm. um, a gathering of chiefs, and they were basically reflecting on, you know, it's been 20 years since the, the, the treaty's been signed, and they were reflecting on how things were and relationship with the crown, that kind of thing. Now, those speeches are very telling. You have um, a very clear um, deference to the Queen mm -hmm. um, and, and the idea of sovereignty is discussed explicitly. Now, another way to, to look at it is if you look at the speeches at Waitangi and you look at the chiefs who didn't want to sign and weren't happy with it, they express that they don't want to give up their sovereignty. So they know that's what's at stake. So if they're rejecting that, then the ones that did sign it were yeah. aware that was but what. we all have to forget like. this. And if we ever raise the historiosity of mm. all of this, we get held down with cries of racism. Yeah. And, and that's that's what bullies do to silence people. Isn't it? They give them a label that's ab abhorrent, that mm -hmm. you can't, you don't want to have that label put on you. So then you modify your speech mm -hmm. so that you don't get accused of that and then you're silenced. And they do it like labels they give to people like you and, um, you know, where they say you're a turf. That's that's a derogatory insult designed <laughs> to shut you up. It's incredible. I mean, I've been lucky here that the consequences haven't been as bad as it has for women overseas. Mm -hmm. So I've been called a Nazi, a turf, a racist, a transphobe, all the things you can think of. 
If you look at what's happened to some of the women in Australia when they were called Nazis, like like I was, they've had huge consequences. So now you've got several women uh, taking legal action against, um, I think it's the leader of the opposition in Victoria, I, I, I believe, I can't remember his name, but um, he he basically defamed Posey Parker and Moira Deming, who was in his party, and um, a couple of other women who who were organisers of one of Posey's um, John rallies. Pesito. One, John Pesito is his name. That's his name. That's the one. And so the consequences from for those women have been huge. The, the utilisation of the the name Nazi of the slur Nazi mm. to say to these women, Moira Deming has has just, she was attacked and now she's only able to take um legal action and it's probably going to take women years to go through the courts. Mm. And they do this because they know they have the power to harm us in this way. So when we're told that the most vulnerable group of people are uh, this this trans community and we have to, to bow to them every whim because they're so vulnerable. It is extraordinary then that these same people can shut down our events, can destroy our careers. But they're vulnerable. Can, you know, they're supposed to be the vulnerable ones, and yet they have the power to make governments, media, just absolutely cut out to, to their wishes, you know. Even the most outrageous things, like I'm not sure if you've seen um, it's come out yesterday, I believe, about the, the breast milk situation um, where uh, the NHS or one of the trusts of the NHS released um, research apparently or a statement that um, the artificially hormone-induced discharge from trans women's nipples is just as good for, for, for babies as mother's breast milk. That has required very senior people, you know, medical professionals and, you know, hospital administrator type levels to sign off on that. And it doesn't take a genius to know that men don't breastfeed and that anything that is artificially generated is not breast milk that's coming out. And yet something as abhorrent as this, it is the women calling it out who get told off and not the fetishists who are promoting men breastfeeding who, who are completely protected and, and even celebrated in some cases. Yeah, it, it's this is what I don't understand because... If I was a woman, and you know, oh, I guess I can be. Well, just tell me you are, and that's how yeah. it works, right? Yeah, I mean, when, <laughs> oh, oh, it's a funny anecdote. You know, when I had my stroke, I I couldn't walk properly and I couldn't use my right arm. And I said about doing rehabilitation, and some of that involved picking up a shotgun and competing in shotgun events and things like that. And a mate of mine said, Cam, why don't you, um, why don't you um, apply to go to the Paralympics? Um, but even better, why don't you apply to go to the Paralympics as a woman? <laughs> and he says, you'd look great. And I said, oh, I'll wear a kilt. And I have my hairy legs hanging out the bottom. And I have my beard. And I'll say I'm a woman. I'll go into the into the Paralympics and the shooting in the shotgun sports. And I, and I seriously thought about doing that just to take the piss. Um, well, a guy that I got to know through online years ago, Zuby, he's a um, kind of rapper, businessman, but he's, he's half American, half British. Yeah. And he um, he became famous because he briefly identified as a woman, beat all of the deadlifting records, and then unidentified as a woman. <laughs> yeah, um, I remember seeing that. He did it specifically yeah. because the record, in, I think it was the record in Canada, wasn't it? was held by a man pretending to be a woman mm. as the woman's wow. um, deadlifting record. So he went in there and blitzed him. Hashed it. But that's the thing. <laughs> you know, there's all these men that are declaring themselves women and competing in women's sports. Mm. And I view their actions as similar, if not worse, because of the deception involved to people who wear medals that they never earned. And yeah, you know, they, 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 they're saying that they're a woman, they're entering the sports, they're swimming and beating everybody um, in the race and then saying, look at me, I won a gold medal. But what I can't understand is the silver medal and bronze medalist 
just refusing to get I would if that was me I'd refuse to get on the on the podium with it I would yeah. speak out and and yes you're probably going to get demonized by your sport and band mm. but principles are principles aren't they well that's like what I was talking about before about the motivation of fear um mm. and I think now we're seeing many more women and girls speak out and refuse and that kind of thing, which is fantastic. But if you look at the example of, I'm not sure if you've seen Riley Gaines in, mm. in America. So she's the swimmer um, that spoke out against Leah Thomas, uh, yeah. the trans woman who, who was bloody useless in, in the bloke sport and then suddenly was winning all the women's sport. And Well, that's the thing, isn't it? They're all hopeless as men. And then <laughs> like in order to make themselves feel better, they go and compete with women. And, like, and we what sort of man is that? <laughs> what what was incredible about like when when Riley talks about what she went through is mm. that it's not just the for, for swimming in this case, it's not just what happened in the pool, which is bad enough the unfairness of it, but these young women were utterly gaslit in that they were not told that Leah was going to appear in their changing room with his dick out, and they turned around were really alarmed. They, as a group, uh, laid complaint and said, look, we don't want males in the changing room. They were lectured and told they needed to change their thinking, they needed to not be so horrible, blah, 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 blah. There was nothing they could do. In the end, they would take turns getting changed in cupboards because they felt so intimidated and also because Leah's behaviour was often sexualized. And that is a motivation here that we're not allowed to talk about. Um, the you know, creepiness. Same, yeah, same with the breast milk thing. What reason would a man have, regardless of whether he thinks he has he's a woman, to need to breastfeed a child? Oh, come um, on, every bloke wants boobs to play with. <laughs> Some of them don't even have them. They're still trying to, you know, <laughs> they haven't even had any surgery or anything. But, yeah. you know, there's the, the sexual element is something that we're not supposed to talk about. But if you visit, you know, the, the trans forums online, on Reddit, on anything like that, a, bit, bit of a lot me. of the motivation is, is sexual and um, it harms our ability to talk about this honestly and about the impact on women and children if we can't have honest conversations about that, and that is that we don't want to partake in the sexual fetish of a man. Well, that's what it is really, isn't it? It's mm -hmm. a bloke who wants to dress up like a woman. And, like, he can do that all he wants, but he doesn't have to come into my space. And This is the thing that I don't <laughs> get, right, is, is that, okay, I, I'm heterosexual. Um, I'm not out there parading um, my sexuality. Everywhere mm. I go, I'm not out there demanding other people recognize my sexuality or people call me by certain things. I mean, if people wanted to call me something, I mean, I could insist my pronouns are ham handsome and clever. But yeah, that's yeah. that's that's the ridiculousness of it all, isn't it? With because it goes right down to mm. this this pronoun thing where people are dictating what other people can call you when they're talking about you and you're not in the conversation. Because because pronouns yeah. only occur in a third party when you're talking about somebody power. else, right? It's about power because uh, I have to say at different times I previously thought, okay, well, if I want to be polite, I can use the pronouns they want, whatever. And I've got to the point now where I don't because it, it, it's the slippery slope thing, right? It's the 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 politeness over pronouns becomes the demand to access the space that, oh, well, if you call me she, then you must see me as a woman. So I must be a woman. So I have to then be allowed into the space and the sport. And, and it kind of like goes from there. And it's about um, control. Like, you know, I wrote a piece for a mainstream publication recently and I got it back edited with the pronouns changed. And I was like, do you know me? I am not going to, to have anything published that is playing these games. So I said, fine, I'll take it out and I'll just repeat their name over and over again because I'm not going to have those pronouns well, That's there. the thing, isn't it? If you're talking to somebody in person, like I'm talking to you, I'm not going to call you whatever your pronouns are. I don't know what they are. Mm -hmm. and frankly, I don't care. Um, to me, you're Annie, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to use your name. And if yeah. I'm talking about you to somebody else, I'm not going to say she this, and I'm going to say Annie said this and Annie said that. Mm. So it's this 
microaggression that's actually expanded to full-on aggression to control people on what they say. And it's exactly as you say, it's a power play to get you to conform. Mm. I mean, I previously worked in the the public service before I was in parliament. Oh, I feel sorry for you. It (laughs) wasn't It really was. Um, and what I what I was so amazed by is the amount of time we spent before every meeting, every who basically ticking these virtue virtue signal um, kind of um, things off. But actually, it, it wasn't about virtue signaling. It was about power and control. It was the HR department was running the shop. Um, and so we had to, you know, say our pronouns. We had to do um, either a waiata or a karakia. And, and I asked once because I said, look, I've got no problem with us doing, you know, if we do some today stuff, that's okay. But I'm not religious. So why are we doing a karakia? Like the, this is a public service. And that threw a whole lot of, you know, um, fox among the, um, the hens, whatever you say, because they know how to push back on um we're doing this because it's really important that we honour Māori culture, but they don't know how to react when you're suddenly like, I'm not Christian, so why are we doing a Christian but, prayer? But if you look at the Karakias, they're actually not Christian anyway because they're talking <laughs> about the sky god and the tree god and the water god and all. Well, that's not Christian, is it? It's animism. No, I think the ones we, because the ones we did were, but, um, I yeah, I totally take that there would be a lot of... Um, but that's the thing, right? If I, if I was running a public organisation and I am a Christian mm. and I decided, right, we we're going to start every meeting with a prayer and yeah. I'm going to call it a prayer and, and, and it's going to be a Christian prayer, there would be howls oh. of outrage. The PSA yeah. would be mobilising people to march in the streets about this. The news mm. media would run it incessantly uh, until I caved and changed the mm. organisation. But mm. somebody says, are we going to have a karakia? Oh, okay, that's all right. Yeah. It's not all right. It's a waste There's of time. so much of that stuff that um, there is nothing wrong with if you want to um, do your karakia before you eat or before you, um, you know, when you're at home, if that's your thing, that is, that's great for you. Likewise, if you're into the pronoun thing and you and your friends want to talk about your pronouns all the time, Absolutely fine. But if you're working in the public service, why are we dedicating so much time to these performances? Oh, it's worse than that, though, Annie. Mm-hmm. I know somebody worked for um, the call centre business you know, during the COVID thing and phoning up, mm-hmm. and every Wednesday they'd have way out of Wednesdays. And yeah, up we- till 11 o'clock in the morning, it was, you know, 15 yeah, renditions of 10. Well. Yeah, 15 yeah. renditions of 10 guitars, you know. <laughs> And, and and that was accepted. You now, if you said, "Oh, we're going to have a heavy metal Tuesday," people would be outraged. You know, but but because I, you call I, it Waiata Wednesday, it's all good. I did. Um, I did think of. I wonder if I could OAA how much time was spent on Waiatas, <laughs> but there's no. <laughs> there's it's, no it's way insane. It, oh, <laughs> the other thing is is, but this is controlling speech. This is. Silence, like I was in court um, before Christmas and mm-hmm. I hadn't been in court for four or five years. And that's the time frame that it changed. And the previous time I was in court, you know, the, the judge comes in, everybody stands up. There's a few mumbled Maori words as they come in, which is read off a card. Mm-hmm. And then the judge sits down and then peers at everybody, you know, and says, who's first? And then somebody <laughs> stands up and says, oh, yes, it's Henry for the plaintiff or um, such and such for the defendant, and it, it's all done very quickly in about three seconds. Mm. Now, now that they stand up, oh, uh, yes, uh, and it's all in Maori, and they start uh, listing their whaka papa to multiple levels for ten minutes, and then finally at the end of it, say their name and who they're representing. It's That's insane. Incredible. I mean, uh, I mean. I can understand if if the case is involving people who all kind of have that worldview. Great. Yeah, no, this this case but, had nothing to do with that. But and the thing that you know, it sounds trivial, but how long does that take? Our court system. I can tell you how long it took. It took twenty yeah. minutes. Yeah, 
like we are, we should be motoring through cases because you know there are people waiting. I, I know of one um, murder trial that's waiting to to go to court, and it's like taking three years. We should not be taking three years to hear homicide, you know, um, cases. Mm. Um, and and I think. Uh, we should be finding ways to speed these processes up. And so we, we you know, we set up these kind of um, authorities like the Employment Relations Authority where to divert things out of the courts to hopefully, you know, speed things up. Those are now clogged now because they spend so much time pissing around. So it's like why this are we... All, like, yeah, this all comes down to free speech. Right. It, mm-hmm. Everything comes down to free speech. And I always point out to people when they're talking about the United States right? and they say, oh, it's terrible. You know, the, the Second Amendment in the United States is, is appalling. And I said, well, you need to understand something. You can't have the First Amendment, which is the right to free speech, without having the right to defend that free speech, which is what the Second Amendment's about. Well, we don't have that in New Zealand. And mm-hmm. so we... We we have this bully pulpit that's largely infested with the media mm. that are that is shutting people down, silencing people, bullying people. I mean, Nikki Hager stated that the reason why he wrote Dirty Politics was to take me out of the political discourse because mm. I was too effective at what I'm doing, and he wanted to silence the other journalists that were talking to me. Now. Mm. I was, at that stage, I'd already had a high court judge determine that I was a journalist. So we Mm. had a journalist, Nikki Hager, attacking another journalist for Mm. the political ideas that person had that were opposed, that Nikki Hager was opposed to, with the desired aim to silence that person, me, from Mm. talking to other journalists to share ideas. And nobody said a thing. It was a mammoth hit job, but that's the thing is like there's always uh, people are scared of Nikki because he's like this <laughs> because he's like this recluse who hides and then pops up with a book and doesn't give opportunity for right of reply, right? So he breaks you, all the rules of journalism, yeah, but everyone goes, yeah. "Oh, he's a great journalist." No, he's not. He's a lying, sniveling scumbag who does hit jobs for money. Yeah, the exact things um, he accused me of doing. Yeah. It, I mean, maybe it was actually titled "Dirty Politics" because it was all dirty, and and um, but they missed I, out all the interactions I had with Labour and Green politicians. For some strange reason, they weren't in the book. <laughs> I, I had Chris Trotter ring me up. He says, "I don't know why Nikki Hag is complaining about dirty politics. All politics is dirty." I mean, it's yeah, so, exactly, Chris. You you like. This, it is thrilling to work in politics, um, and I enjoyed almost every minute of it. It's the best but game out. It is like swimming with sharks all the time, and it's, I mean, and that's where it is it, the world over. It's like that. There is no like nice parliament where everyone's holding hands and stuff because that's not how things get no. get done. We've got an adversarial system. Because that works. Because of a challenge of debate of ideas, one versus the other, right? It could be worse. We could be like, I think it's the Greeks or the Italians have punch-up all the time in the the house, you know? Taiwan Taiwan has regular punch-ups. Taiwan, Thailand. Fisticuffs in the parliament. We should bring that back along with smoke. Well, Truman did give it a go, didn't he? Yeah, exactly. (laughs) But, uh, you know... um, it's, I, I think politics has been diminished since we got rid of smoke-filled rooms, but that's a whole other argument. <laughs> Winston would definitely uh, agree there. I think that the whiskey drinking smoked um, smoke-filled rooms, um, yeah, it's a diff- it was a different way of doing politics. And I've had people ask me actually, um, how do you think Luxon's going to cope because he doesn't drink? And it seems like a really silly question. But there is like history the world over through through many different systems of the late night drink, the discussion, the the, the kind of relationship building. Um, and yeah, people can argue that that shouldn't be over alcohol, but it is. Well, so I mean, that's the thing. It's, I mean, I've got a multitude of stories from the 90s when I was sitting in the smoke-filled rooms watching deals get done, you know, Mm -hmm. um, both internal party stuff and cross-party stuff, 
deals were done over over fags and and whiskey, and um <laughs> and you know you mentioned earlier on in the interview about polarization, and that's the thing that I find most frightening about how politics or how society has become. We are so polarized now. You you're either right or wrong. There's no happy medium. There's no well. Hang on a second. You know, and I used to laugh about um that um. Stephen Crowder, you know, he'd sit down at a university with some topic and say, you know, um, trans, trans, yeah, trans, <laughs> women, trans women aren't real women. Convince me, mm. you know, or something like that, and have a discussion. But yeah. He can't, he can't do that now because he just gets torn apart. Yeah. Um, we've well, lost the ability Canada to debate. Security will usher him off because he's causing a, a disturbance. A disturbance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you think about Helen Clark and Phil Goff. And, you know, all of that era of politicians, that's all they ever did is cause disturbances. Nowadays, they wouldn't oh, be allowed to. I know. It's it's quite amazing. Um, it, there's a lot of hypocrisy in it, like the sanitization of politics, the sanitization of protest. Um, it irritates me to no end because usually the people involved in that process from like from Labour's side, they, they did protest, you know. Mm. Um, was it... Um, Grant Robertson or Chris Hipkins that got arrested for a protest? Chris Hipkins. Mm. Chris Hipkins. No, and that's a point of pride for him. Yeah. Um, you know, and but then wanting to sanitize stuff now. Same as with, you know, of course you don't want bullying in Parliament, but it's also a very unique environment where you can't have staffers holding shit over ministers' heads or MPs' heads because it just doesn't work. Mm. Um and yet Trevor Mallard, who is well known as perhaps the naughtiest MP to ever be in Parliament in terms of drinking and punching and not getting on with people or bullying, um, he brought in, you know, this investigation trying to, you know... He smeared an innocent person. He called a man who wasn't a rapist a rapist. I mean, that's one of the worst things, you know. And, think about and most the of the media didn't touch it. It was the it was the bravery of Barry Soper that brought that to attention, uh, yeah. and he and, and Mallard attacked Soper for that. Just incredible. And I think you know I know nothing about the the person who, who who he accused, and he might well have done other stuff, but he wasn't a rapist. No. Um, and so he he was utterly wrong to to to. Call him that, and um, you know. And I said before, I've been called everything under the sun, and I actually, you know, as, as a female, I haven't been called that. And I think that would be possibly the most one of the most awful things you could be called. And and then the taxpayer had to pay a lot of money to to rectify that through after he fought it as long as he could. Yeah, yeah. You know, so we paid hundreds of thousands of dollars, and I mean, rightly so that that guy was entitled to it, but because of Trevor's lack of self-control that happened and you know and and he changed the rules on alcohol so like staffers we couldn't drink in our in the offices um unless there was like a, um, an MP present and like all the stuff back in his day Is it everyone, more responsible than other people the staff is more responsible <laughs> half the time it's the staff that are saying to the MP or the minister oh, perhaps you better not have another one minister <laughs> well, uh, that was the case. I know, like, we'd be in Pickwick's, the bar in, um, mm. in the Beehive, and there would be a certain minister who uh, Jacinda Ardern had put on a no-alcohol um, ban because of his behaviour, and he would show up in Pickwick's and we'd be telling the, the Labour staffers, hey, you might want to come and get your guy. He's here <laughs> He's here on the booze. And it's it's like, actually, it's the staffers who were kind of, um, yeah, sure but the staff is <laughs> the staff is. I've, in my experience of, of of seeing staff and ministers and MPs interaction, I've always found the staff to be very protective of their minister or their or their MP to the point where they say, you know, actually you've had too much to drink, or I'd better put you in a taxi mm-hmm. and actually take them home and do those sorts of things. So for well, I think that, that was one of the scandals last year with. Um... Oh, from Toki Toki. Uh, what was her name? The MP, uh, Broca lady. Oh yeah, Anna Law. Anna Law. Anna Law. Yeah, she she wasn't she. Her one of her staffers was upset because they were having to sober drive her all the time. <laughs> I 
I have to yeah. say, I never had to do that for Judith. Judith was always good. <laughs> no, Judith, Judith was always good. Yeah. Mm. Um, you know, it's just, I, I sit here and watch um, our society falling apart around our ears. And like you, I, I lay a lot of the blame um, with our very liberal media that have mm. decided that they're going to pick sides. It used to be mm. that they reported the news, now they try and make the news. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, it was a time that if you wanted to make the news and if you wanted to change laws and you wanted to do those sorts of things, you became an MP. You actually mm -hmm. stood for parliament, got yourself elected, uh, and and then went set about doing it. But the media think that they're, they, they've abrogated their responsibility as the fourth estate, and as a result of doing that, they've brought about an assault, an un, you know, unprecedented assault mm -hmm. on free speech. And yeah. all of these arguments, all of these things that we talk about, um, treaty principles, uh, the turf wars, you know, Posey Parker, all of these things come back to one thing, and that's the right, and under our Bill of Rights, the right to impart and receive mm -hmm. information freely. Yeah. And it seems that we're being censored, and, and, and Ardern was the worst of that, you know, the, the podium of truth, the one source of truth all of that sort of, it was nonsense. Mm -hmm. But yeah. the media went along with it. And so the media is supposed to be at the fourth estate holding the powerful to account, but all too often they're holding hands with the powerful and Absolutely. merrily dancing all over our rights. It's interesting now to see a bit of a shift in them, though, because, I mean, I have this conversation with people a lot where there are people who have very strong views about um, funding of the media and stuff, and I definitely think that, you know, the Public Interest Journalism Fund was not a good idea. However, I don't think those funding scandals, if you will, are what has driven this. What has driven this is purely that the type of person who is a journalist now is a university educated, totally um, liberally kind of indoctrinated through the same universities, um, tend to be from a middle to upper class background, tend to be white, most of them, but have a complex about being white. And so you end up with no matter which mainstream media platform you're looking at, they're all the same because they come with the same set of views. They've had the same education. They've got the same social background. They believe the same things. Whereas back in the day, you could go from one um, publication to another and get very different views. So mm. you had, had some variety. You also had, you know, working class people who didn't go to university but were switched on people um, going straight into journalism and mm. providing that perspective. And so... We're kind of we're not being served because it, it's like this club of people. It's a homogenized brain. view, isn't it? it everything's been, become homogenized. But if you look at Reality Check Radio, look, I don't agree with Paul Brennan on a, a large number of things, but he's a, he's good a dude, good, but he's a good bloke <laughs> to have a cigar and a drink with, right? Um, I'm never going to agree 100 percent with what Peter Williams says or or Natalie or any of the other you know brilliant hosts that we've got. Everybody's got their own interests and their own points of view. But the great thing in, in Reality Check Radio is that we can all coexist, green voters and, you know, wombles and all sorts of people with different views. Mm. We all can, can join together because we've got this core belief uh, that, that we are exactly what we, our name says, that we're a reality check. We are uh, allowing people with differing views to air their views in a long mm -hmm. format, you know, it's not a 15-minute, let's see if we can get some hits on somebody. Mm. And and it's better listening. It's better radio. And mm. that's why our audience is growing, and that's why we're actually taking a stick to the mainstream media that all once over lightly. And, mm. um, we and might they, would, they, would, they would be very derisive of you guys. I, like they, 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 they have been, yeah. Is, you know, um, this... Uh, this idea that um, that what you're doing is less than because it's not um, mm. legacy, it's not done as they do, which is hand in hand with um, the public service, with the with um, elements of the government, though less so now. You guys are more prone to misinformation because they don't agree with you, I guess. And and but we've got you know, even got people who are in the same space as us who are calling us. 
um, you know, derisive names, um, you know, Cooker Radio or or Rabbit Hole Radio and stuff like that. Um, you know, that says more about him than it does about us. We don't actually don't care because we're here about the discourse and the conversation. And yeah. um, that's why we've got people like yourself talking to us, you know, on the show about politics, about freedom of speech, about the challenging issues that are out there, calling things as I, they are. Yeah, and I think um, I'm always quite happy to, you know, talk to people in good faith because I think um, the more of these conversations that we have about tricky issues, the more we can find that awful thing called middle ground and pragmatism and all these kind of things to, to find a way through challenges because mm. the way I see it right now, the, 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 the way the, the legacy media and um, the kind of discourses, there is no middle ground to be found on these issues. Like, well, like, nor should they be. I mean, nor should they be. Like, it's okay to not agree. That absolutely, right. it it's perfectly to. okay to not agree. You, mm. we, the, we challenge is, the challenge that, that that I worry about is these issues to do with governance and policy, like the Treaty Principles Bill, where this polarization is being weaponized, and at the end of it, one side is going to be pleased and one is going to be really angry. Instead of trying to have a conversation that. Bridges some of those. Well, we saw that, didn't we, you know? with Waitangi Day, because you had the media oh. that were amping the pressure up. You could almost think that they were hoping mm. for violence. They were talking I about like it. Like the day before, I was full of dread. I thought, oh, God, this is going to be horrendous because I, I felt like the media were hoping something really bad would happen. And, you know, I, on the whole, even though there was some hostility, I think. It was pretty good, you know. Everyone showed up, said their bit. Um, I think it was reported pretty shoddily, especially in, in terms of acts involvement. I mean, mm. Nicole McKee, um, her speech and, and the way she was tickled was pretty awful, mm. and she was uh, trying to give. Um, that's a because that's speech. because Nicole and David and Winston and Shane, they're the wrong sort of Maori. That's the prevailing attitude. It's like you're the wrong sort of woman as well. I'm the wrong sort of lesbian as well. That's what I always get. And it, it's quite extraordinary to me. Like I, I wrote a piece recently about um, the Green Party because they tried me nuts. I used to vote for them when I was younger, so I, I, I think it's why. But, you know, the fact that they are front and centre at Pride, screaming the place down, waving flags and acting like they're our babysitters or something, when they have spent the entire first part of this term of parliament supporting terrorist organisation, one of which has just sentenced 30, um, 13 sorry, um, yep. homosexual men to death, plus about 60 are getting corporal punishment. You know, this is the Houthis where, where um, Marama Davidson is on record in the House of Parliament defending their, their right to attack civilian and freight ships because they're upset about what's happening in Gaza. And she's, this was during the ministerial statement. That'll be, that that'll be Gaza where they tow homosexuals behind motorcycles and throw them off yeah. tall buildings. That, yeah. I mean, that Gaza. Exactly. And so I've kind of gone, actually, the Greens shouldn't be welcome at Pride until they stop supporting groups that kill homosexuals. Like, mm. That's how they would be if the shoe was on the other foot, you know. Yes, but 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 they've got a cloak, they've got a shield of sanctimony and a cloak of invisibility that shields them from all of the that that, that they don't you know, hypocrisy knows no bounds with the Greens. No. I mean, I think to be honest, they're they're in for a a rapid tumble um with the exit of James Shaw. Um, whatever your opinions on James, and I know some people have issues with his university transcripts or something, but um I don't care. I never went to university. <laughs> yeah, I did, but I um some I, I think I must have been in the last batch before indoctrination. But um like whatever whatever you kind of think of James Actually, Shaw. I, t- I tell a lie, I did go to university for one yeah, um, but the politics lectures I found incredibly boring because I'd spent a lifetime in politics and here was this professor who'd spent, you know, a lifetime lecturing about politics and the two things were completely different. <laughs> like, I, just don't really I had know. lived experience and he had book learning. Mm-hmm. No, it was never going to work. Yeah, yeah. 
I, I, I think that, that James Shaw's, um, his sensibleness will be severely missed in the Greens because even though he is um, a bit bonkers on some stuff, he was the kind of dad. He was reasonable. Yeah. He was mm. reasonable. You could talk to him. And the times that I've met him, I found him to be a very nice man who was capable of discussing um, mm. uh, views that he didn't agree. We had a good chat, you know. But um, I think without him, you're left with co-leaders, Marama, presuming Chloe, who don't like each other. And will be in a Marama is very competitive, and I can, be I can see Chloe getting a a, a fist of fives um, in the back <laughs> rooms of Parliament from Marama at some point. <laughs> I can just see that it's something that you know we can all look forward to. But yeah, I agree with you. I think yeah. the Greens are deluded. They they think that they um, had a brilliant uh, campaign that their arguments uh, had merit. And they've they failed. just copped the, the, the drop off from Labor. Yeah, yeah, that's that's exactly got. right. They've they yeah. they've they lacked they lacked the humility to recognise that they picked up um, people off Labor because they couldn't bring themselves to vote Labor, so they voted Green. Mm, and exactly. at the next election, they're going to go back. Yeah, exactly. It's what happens, you know. Um, and and it's it's actually amazing on the right side of politics that David has grown. I say David, I should say Act now, but Act has grown again because mm. they should have seen a swing back. But that's something that National probably needs to think about as to why when they grew, they didn't pick up um, yeah. those Act voters again. Um, and I think we can all probably um, quite easily see why. But um, it, it, it's it's Taylor's oldest time. The pattern's always there when the when the main parties are not serving their their base. Um, they they go to the next best thing, which is those um, ones on the periphery, um, and that's why that's why Greens are so big this time. And I think that we we're in for a term of chaos from them because Marama and Chloe will be trying to outdo each other rather than work together. And whereas James would make concessions, Chloe will not make concessions. Um, and so I think we'll be in for a, a bit of a ride with them. Yeah, she had Chloe has right, righteous indignation on her side all the time. Right? She's yeah. absolutely adamant. She's 100% right and will not countenance anybody saying anything different. No. The only thing I can't work out is whether it was Marima or Chloe or both that were involved in stabbing Golrez, because I reckon that's an inside job. Do you reckon it's an inside job? Because I know, um, obviously, that the thing that disturbs me most about the Golrez situation is that that story was shocked around a little bit before it was it made its way to ZB, mm. and other media didn't want to publish it. Think about like what a massive thing it's become now. She's lost. If that had been a national MP that was um, oh. shoplifting, we would never have heard the end of it. But it was all, oh no, she's a woman of colour. Um, you know, it's understandable. Um, it's stressful. Her job, blah blah. Excuse, excuse, excuse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you're a thief. Yeah. Well, that's. I mean, that was one of my pieces that has had the most anger directed at it that isn't about trans stuff because that usually gets the most anger. No, because you were and, attacking a woman of colour. <laughs> but it was because I said that actually, you know, we can say sympathy for you on mental health. That's really awful, you know. It's just a crutch you know. that, that politicians is, use, isn't it, to get out of the, the hard stuff. Oh, I was a bit sad. I'm feeling depressed. You know, everybody has – New Zealand's one of the high, highest medicated yeah. pe um, countries in the world. Almost everybody you meet is on some sort of antidepressant, right? Yeah, so I've been, so we I've don't use it very, as a crutch. <laughs> I've been very outspoken over the years. I have bipolar disorder and I yeah. have had to spend a lot of time with doctors and therapists learning how to live with it, take medication. If I shoplifted – I myself would take responsibility for it. But you can bet my dad and my partner and my sisters would all be like, that's on you. They wouldn't be saying, oh, you've, you've got bipolar, how sad. Yeah. Um, they'd be saying, what the were you doing shoplifting? <laughs> exactly. <You know? laughs> yeah. And Lucky and you didn't do it when you were at my house. I would have taken you to the police by myself. 
<laughs> well, they would. My dad would totally be the parent who would blum and drive us there and say, right, she's been shoplifting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that's the thing, isn't it? Our, we've got the society now where there are almost no consequences for outrageous behaviour. And mm. you can explain it away. Oh, no, can't you understand? I'm an oppressed um, trans person. You know, I'm a vulnerable mm. person. Oh, no, Ma- Maori, it's understandable why they do um, that because they're vulnerable. Yeah, you know, we saw this all the time in the COVID rubbish. Uh, you know, the these are vulnerable really communities. Oh, vulnerable old people, vulnerable Maori, vulnerable Pacific Islanders. It, if you tell someone they're vulnerable long enough and loud enough, guess what? They'll believe they'll be, it. They'll believe it. Right. Yeah. And on the other hand, you've got you know Rari Waititi who says that Maori have got superior DNA and all that, but then he's got his hand out for the vulnerable payments. So which is, is it? Which is it, mate? <laughs> yeah. I I just think it's um the bigotry of low expectations is mm. significant in this country and that what people forget is when they say this group of people needs help because they're not capable of doing it themselves you're saying that you are capable and you're able to it's condescending it isn't it it's yeah. condescending it's it's paternalistic mm. uh, and it's old-fashioned but politicians keep doing it it's well it's, it's another thing that if they don't hit those buzzwords they get the bad headline, you know. You look at, I mean, I watch post-cap most weeks because I, I don't know. Because you're a I political tragic that. like me. <laughs> <laughs> and you look at the questions. It doesn't matter what the Prime Minister is talking about. He could be talking about the price of bread or he could be talking about, I don't know, the Olympics or something. They will always stick to the formulaic questions of you'll hear about what does this mean for Māori um, don't you think that the poor would da 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 and it, it, everything is squeezed into that narrative instead of it being um, it's, it's like the response to Louise Upston's um, comments they go oh, and get a whole lot of you know vulnerable beneficiaries who are I'm frightened about what's going to happen oh and that's what the news you know what's my favorite thing to do is when they those people that they put on like the morning shows or in the news of vulnerable people google them and you they're always all find activists them. they're all activists or they're all like members of the labor party who you know like yeah. always without fail <laughs> David Farrer would used to write articles he used to put posts on his blog and said oh that's a terrible story of course, what the um, news uh, media forgot to mention, or the journalist and stuff forgot to mention, is that this person is a branch, um, uh, a branch chairman of the Labour Party. Yeah, yeah. You know, they, yeah. they've got this list of aggrieved people for almost any um, mm. perceived um, trouble that have got a, a, a handy little spout sound bite about how worse off they're going to be. And, yeah. and the flip side of that is if we just kept on spending money, that'd all be okay. That's been the, like, um, I just watched Question Time. Um, again, tragic, but I did. And Louise Upston was, she fielded, I think, three questions maybe um, because of the welfare announcement. Essentially, what she is saying is that life is harder for people on the benefit. So it let's is. try and help them off the benefit. Yeah, and that that is what she's saying. She's not saying they're bad people. She's not saying let's take everything off them right away. Let's you know it's life's hard, so let's make it better. Ricardo uh, Menendez March's question: I was like, are you seriously saying that the government shouldn't have obligations on beneficiaries who are on Job Seeker to attend meetings and to try and get a job? Because that's what he was saying. He's was, he was basically saying you can't prove that this helps them to get a job, so you should just leave them alone. Just give them the money and leave them alone. Right. It's it's, it's incredible because that's why I call him El Woco Loco. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, he's. I don't know if they've made him like the little shadow leader of the house or something. He's just he's a whinger. But he's doing all these points of order now, and and they're always really bad, like or wrong. Jerry Brownlee will just laugh at him. <laughs> Isn't Jerry a bit better speaker than Trevor? I mean, you know. Oh God, I know. I just, loved Adrian though. I did think Adrian. Yeah, Adrian was, a was good. Better. Yeah, I thought um, I thought he was a good speaker. But um, Jerry's getting into his own. I think one of his biggest challenges is going to be um, breathing. Breathing. <laughs> and God bless our deputy prime minister. 
but he he has to rein him in because Winston is just jumping up at the drop of a hat for points of order that are probably not points of order. They're just him making a point, you know? Yeah. And so he has to, and Winston will keep doing that if he's got free reign to do it because that's Winston. But isn't like, it wonderful to watch? You know, oh, it is. It's hilarious. Like I keep um, sharing some of the clips. He gave he gave James Shaw a good smack last week when he made some comment. He says, "Oh, you should just be thankful I'm not talking about academic credentials." Just <laughs> <laughs> sit down. Anyway, <laughs> Eddie, on, on that yeah. note, we've run out of time, really. It's been a real pleasure chatting to you about free speech and everything else, including the speakers and what they're doing. We'll have to have you on again. It's been a real pleasure. It was um, lovely to, to meet you finally as well. Yeah. <laughs> no, likewise, <laughs> likewise. And he's at the forefront of what I termed the turf wars. But the core thrust of that debate is actually a free speech debate. These are important debates that need to be had. And we need to avoid cancel culture and all that means with deplatforming and the silencing of people with differing views. And that's why we here at RCR always will explore both sides of any issue. Let me know your thoughts on this topic, good or bad, by emailing inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. This is The Crunch with Cam Slater. Conversations with a side of controversy, right here on RCR. Right, now it's time for an audience favourite, Cam's Buddies. This week we'll find out what they think about the government moving to ban gang patches. Can they do it? Will it work? And what about civil liberties and free expression? My producer has them all lined up and ready to go. Let's go now to Cam's Buddies. Hi, Lindley. Welcome to Cam's Buddies. Hello, Cam. How's things? Fantastic. Oh, that's good. Hey, we got lots of good feedback from your letter last week uh, um, to Grant Robertson. Lots of uh, of messages. So uh, that was very well received. Yeah, well, it was a bit sad to have to say it, but I need to speak on behalf of all the people that have suffered the same fate. Yeah, and, and, you know, uh, that was the message that we got from the listeners and it was uh, heartfelt and it certainly had my tears rolling down my face. So anyway, we've got a happier uh, note this week. We've got, um, I want to put to you a question about the government making moves this week to uh, ban gang patches. Do you think it'll work? Uh, what about um, civil liberties um you know, issues with freedom of expression and those sorts of things. I'm keen to get your thoughts on these gang patches and these rat bags who wear them. Right. Well, the um, freedom of expression and all that, Gus, that's actually sort of under the Bill of Rights, isn't it? Mm. Mm. Um, And it did fail with Michael Laws ultimately, and I guess these gang people backed by heaps of money will go through the courts I expect that to happen. I don't think it will work for a lot of reasons. But I do credit the coalition government for having a go. That's good. But in my opinion, this is all about money. Yeah. And there are many ways to make money, and crime's one of them. It's a magnificent racket. I mean, you don't have to have education. You don't have to abide by regulations or anything at all, not even rent, you know, nothing. You just get in there and throw your weight round and um, away you go. And gangs are crime organisations in a big way. And the the incentive is millions of tax and regulation-free dollars, millions and millions and millions. And they've got no education, but they are rat cunning. Yeah, they are. Well, yeah, I I agree with you, and it raises an interesting question that if they're not participating in civil society because they're criminals, because they're mm. visiting their drugs upon various different people and, and they're committing crimes against their neighbours and everybody else, do they actually get to have civil liberties or do we have to wait till we catch them, convict them, stick them in jail and then take away their civil liberties? And so... It seems that we've, we're have we trying to say, well, we can't take away their gang patches because they've got a right to wear them for freedom of expression. 
but but the general population has a right to live without crime. Surely that trumps well, their, yeah, their little jackets with the little embroidered patches on them. That, that is correct. And, of course, the problem is it's not the gang itself. It's um, the crime that sort of spreads out from it and goes right through the community. Absolutely terrible. Um, you know, the methamphetamine racket is huge. Mm. Um, and it affects so many people. And they lure in these stupid young you know, youth, yeah, and run them clean off the rails as well. Although a lot of them, to be fair, are sort of going to go that way anyway. But one or two of them actually have reasonable sort of parents and tee up, you know, with other kids, and they're in, you know, and their, their lives are wasted. But it's, you know, as you say, with civil liber- liberties, well. What about your home being safe and not worrying about it being burgled because somebody wants to pinch some things that uh, can go back to the gang and be cashed in for methamphetamine, you know? Yeah, that, well, I mean, that's, know, that's the thing. what's happening. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Maybe we need to, I mean, this is just a small thing, gang patches. There needs to be a more systemic approach to dealing with crime uh, you know, there's a breakdown in families. Um, there's the inability of uh, of Kiwi citizens to adequately defend themselves. You know, we get told, "Oh, that's all right, call one one one." But let's say you live in the country, you know, uh, so out on a re- remote rural area. Some guy rocks up, starting to steal your sheep or your four wheel drive or your motorbike or whatever. You ring the police. They could be over an hour away, and uh, so you leave. Oh, you can't. You- you can't even get them on the phone half the time. And, um, you know, I wanted to report something. There was a car left out on the beach early one morning, and I thought, well, I'll just pop through Amberley, and um, I, I wrote the number down of the car. Mm. It was very odd to have a car way out on the beach. Yeah. And I'll drop it into the police station. Well, when I got there, 9 o'clock, and nobody there at all. It's all shut up, locked, cobwebs on the door. Yeah. Police car outside, making us believe that there's police there, but there's not. Yeah, that must be the case right around New Zealand. But I've just got one really interesting figure here somewhere. Here we are, thirty-three gangs in New Zealand. Yeah, and they're now over nine thousand members. There's ten and a half thousand police. Now, if they all united, I, you know, if they had the brains to do that, if they all united, they could actually, and go to one venue, they could actually mow the police over now. The trouble is, is if brains were dynamite, they wouldn't have enough to blow their nose. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. But my word, they're cunning. They're cunning, all right, but they're not, they're not bright because they keep getting caught. And, and so... Uh, yes. The way I'm looking at it is the gang patches is just one thing. I, I think, you know, oh, I do we, think we it's, need um, to stop this woke crim hugging. They're there. It's because you were breastfed, not bottle fed, or some other malarkey that they come up with. We actually need to address crime at the lowest level and bubble that up so that we take an interest in ex- absolutely every level of crime. I mean, you take all these. Ram raids, that was all gang-related. You know, the gangs were organising mm, that. You that's know, right. But they got away with it. People weren't allowed to intervene. If people intervened, the police said, oh, well, we could arrest you. You know, they got it sort of, you know, excuse my language, but the police have it asked backwards. They're victimising mm. um, citizens who are trying to do the job they refuse to do. Yeah, well, the, that's easy meat, you know. I mean, actually going after the criminals and catching them uh, can be a bit scary these days uh, because, <clears throat> I mean, they've nearly all got knives and, uh, oh, well, they did away with guns, didn't they? But the guns are all in the wrong hands. And, well, you know, right. a friend of mine said, a friend of mine said, that's a joke. You can go down to the wharf uh, at Littleton in the middle of the night and depending what country the, the ship came from, you just go there and get your guns and away you go. Yeah, well, the, so, that's the thing. The government um, passed all these gun laws and all they did is take guns off law-abiding citizens. And then they've constructed they this entire massive white elephant of, a, of an organisation that makes people like me, who's a, a collector, um, they make our life a living misery. You know, if their presumption uh, when in, we have any interaction with them is that we're guilty. 
and yet there's oh, criminals yeah, well, out there with unregistered guns doing whatever they want, uh, and a gun register is not going to stop them um, having no, no gang members handed any guns in. No, and they've got heaps of guns, absolutely heaps of them. But I think, um, just from a different perspective, because I know the guys will come up, you know, with a lot of um, other stuff. Um, I think until the authorities realise that this is actually the most fantastic business model in the world um, and get into cracking that, they're not actually going to make any progress because there's such huge money to be made. And as I said, they don't have to honour any regulations or taxes or anything at all. They've got free labour because they just recruit the... um, uh, you know, the young young ones that they're bringing in, they get yep. them to do all the stealing. They don't have to pay anybody. And you compare that with trying to set up a, a decent business yourself. You know, there's no comparison whatsoever. Yeah, you've got health and, and safety, and my, you've got compliance costs, you've got, you know, employment oh, issues. It's it's a nightmare. Gangs don't have any of that, do they? They just, if they've got they a troublesome employee, and, and, they just shoot them in the back of the head. Oh, well, you know, it's just easy and life is cheap, you know. Um, but it goes on all over the world in different forms, from the mafia to the drug cabals and all the rest of it. They're all sort of the same. Um, they do do one or two useful things, um, I must say, for yeah. fraught people. They collect debts for them, don't they? They set <laughs> up insurance jobs and burn hay sheds down and intimidate yeah. witnesses for people. They do, all they sorts do, of do that. It, it, it but, seems to um, me that we just need seriously. politicians. Sorry, we just need politicians with a will to actually not cave in to all the wombles that uh, think that it's all because they had a hard um, life, you know, um, being brought up uh, in a solo parent family or some other excuse that they always trot out. I mean, you know, we've got Golrez Garriman who says, "Oh, I'm, I was feeling stressed, so I, I felt the need to go <laughs> around stealing," you know. <laughs> Not half as stressed as somebody who actually can't afford to buy a cardigan. Well, that's right. A very expensive cardigan. Mm. No, she's a criminal. Um, and sometimes I think maybe Parliament um, in the dis- long distant future is headed for, um, instead of trying to build a new prison, they should just put a big security fence around Parliament and take the ones out that are honest um, they could sort of entertain them down at the local cafe and lock all the others in Parliament and you'd have a new prison because <laughs> um, I, I've never known so many criminals to be in Parliament. Yeah, that's right. So but... that, that's kind of another issue. But um, no, I think that with this thing, um, until they get into ha- how you can stop these people from making such a fortune with no effort whatsoever, um, they're not going to make any progress at all. You can take patches off, or the, it's their jacket, isn't it, really? Yeah. Pull their jackets off them. I'll tell you what, I won't be putting my name forward to go up and take one off them. No. But I mean, what, maybe one way to reduce crime is to for the government to introduce the castle doctrine. Have you heard of that? No. There's some laws and no, there's some laws in, in Florida's got the castle doctrine and Texas has got it, I think. And that is that your home is your castle and you can defend it any way you see fit. And if somebody's inside your house, you can shoot them um, because you're yes. defending your castle. Well, I think that's a good idea. That's how it should be. And yeah. uh, you know, I can't even put an electric fence at the gate because I might sting somebody. Yeah, well put a put a bull fence in there and really sting them. <laughs> a bear pit would be good. <laughs> I'd probably run into it myself. Um, I always thought sharpened no, stakes and um, and and landmines was a good idea. <laughs> no, I don't know. They're pretty pretty cunning because the heads are, are of these gangs they, they don't go out and do the things, you know. No, they sit there and bank all the money. And, and you're right. The police need to to concentrate on the business model and taking the cash away. So it's interesting to see Stuart Nash yes. throwing uh, some of the uh, his Labour you know mates under the bus by saying, "Well, I wanted to make the the limit it, instead of you know, confiscations being for things that are over thirty thousand. I wanted to make it zero dollars. So we took everything. And um, and Kerry yes. Allen, who was the Justice Minister, said, "Oh, we're not doing <laughs> that because that would be racist." You yes, know? I know. 
she should know all about um, crime and everything. She's certainly an expert in the field. But Stuart Nash, you know, <clears throat> I actually was, I like you, I was surprised that he actually, um, well, almost snitched on his um, yeah. his other, um, you know, Labour Party people. And then I thought, well, you have got to, can't expect much else because he had a professional... Um, Snitcher, you know, in charge, uh, Jacinda Ardern, she encouraged everybody to dob somebody in, didn't she? Yeah. She was a snitch in chief. What a great title. Um, She she obviously never went to a school where, I mean, when I was at school, we had a saying, snitches get stitches. Oh, okay. (laughs) Nobody dobbed at my school. There were no dobbers at my school. You You dobbed, you got a hiding. Well, I'll tell you what, um, I've worked at the freezing works and if you dobbed anybody in there, well, you probably wouldn't live to see, see the next day. It'd be a terrible accident with a meat hook. It'd be a terrible accident, but of course it never happened, you know. No, saw nothing. Because, uh, you know, it's that sort of strength through um, strength through power sort of thing or peace through strength, whatever you like it, to call peace, it. Peace it? through superior firepower. Yes, well, that would be good, but um, I'm not allowed a gun, so I can't do that one. Well, you can get one. I, you could go and get a licence. I'll help you get a licence. Oh, I've got a friend having to um, vouch for her daughter at the moment, and what a performance. Oh, I know, I mean, 36 honestly. pages of palaver. Oh, and, I mean, why wouldn't you want to be a gang member? You know, they don't have to do any of this stuff at all. No, they uh, just you know, are, the money to be. They just ask the gang boss for a gun. Here you go, bro, take that. that that's that's right. easy for them, but not for us. No, and, and, you know, as far as they're concerned, there's easy money to be made, and by hell, they're going to make it. So I can't see how the patches uh, will, you know, it makes us feel better, but we're not the gangs, are we? No. Well, I don't think it – I mean, I'm not afraid of gang members. I never have been. I used to tease them mercilessly with, when they'd turn up – at the church with their patches oh. on and stuff like that. But, um, you know, that's just me. There's plenty of people, and I understand why they are afraid, because they're intimidating. But I just used to say to these guys at the church, oh, um, he, this guy said to me, oh, you're not afraid of me, are you? He says, I'm in the tribesman gang. And I said, oh, well, you're not that tough. And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, you let someone scribble all over your face. Oh, yes. <laughs> and he just, he just cracked up and laughed at me. He said, Oh, you're not afraid? I said, no, I'm not afraid of you, mate. And um, I had a good old mm. chat with them, you know. So, um, But not everyone can do that. You know, they, they, they no, can. No, well, do- I wouldn't like, I, I definitely would not, not like to chat with one. Um, I mean, I got a fright, fright one day I was at BP and one of those guys came in from the Man Up uh, movement. Oh, yeah. Yep. And he had, he had a leather jacket on with this great big circle thing on the back, and you know I, I was looking for the exit. I can tell you, and uh, and I, then I read it, and I thought, oh, hang on, that's uh, that's not actually a bikey, you know, that's something else. Yeah. And then later on, they turned up at the gym, and they had t-shirts with, and on the back it had teaching men to be fathers, and I thought, well, that's a good idea. Yeah, but, I've um, spoken a lot you know, to Brian Tamaki about that Man Up program, and boy, I've got a lot of respect for what he's able to do with those guys. He's converting gang members into valuable members of society that treat their families properly. Oh, it's absolutely outstanding. And the first thing they teach them is to take responsibility, no matter no matter what their culture report is, no matter how bad that mm. is, they actually have to take responsibility for their life, and that's where it starts. Yeah. But... Um, but you know, if I saw saw any any sort of, and they say you know it's targeting Maoris. Well, if I saw a Maori bloke, big and tough, wearing leather and all that insignia on it and that, I'll tell you what, I've never had anything to do with gang members, but I would run a mile. I don't want to be near anybody like that, you yeah. know. But I'm really, really lucky that you know there's just not that presence here, or well, not that you can see. They just get on with whatever they do. Yeah, yeah. Well, Lindley, thank you for but your anyway, thoughts on no, that. Um, I'll get on with the boys and um, see what they've got to say. And I, I would bet they've got a pretty similar perspective to you. Oh, well, that'd be interesting. I'll be listening. All right. Thanks for your call, Thanks, Lindley. Thanks, Cam. Okay. Okay. Bye-bye. 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 Good evening, Jack. Welcome to Cam's Buddies. Hi, Cam. So. You might have seen the news that the government has uh, 
moving to ban gang patches. Do you think it'll work? Yes. Yeah, how? Well, I think the average person who's sort of um, looking at this and saying, oh, yeah, it's not going to work, are probably looking at the Potoki and places like that where these gangs hang out, and there's only one or two elderly constables sitting there, and, of course, it's not going to work with them. But if I remember rightly, don't the police have a strike force against gangs? I don't know whether it's still in existence, but they'll have to bring that back in. And what they'll do is they'll wait till there's some tangy or something like that, and then they'll hit them in force and destroy their bikes and take off their patches and do whatever. And do they, think, they won't do it. Do you Sorry? think the government has got the wherewithal to do that, the steel that's required to, to actually confront the gangs? I'm pretty sure the, the police minister, Mark Mitchell, does, but I'm not sure the rest of the quivering ninnies that sit there in Parliament will cope with um, such an activity. Well, we'll just have to wait and see, won't we? They can't do any worse than the Labour government. I mean, after today's news about the other police minister who wanted to do this and then was vetoed by his fellow Labour ministers. Um, yeah, he threw them under the bus, didn't he? Um, he, he wanted to make the, the threshold for confiscation of assets. Uh, it was set at 30000 He wanted to make it zero, so we take everything off them if they're caught, caught committing a crime. And the Wombles and the Labour Party um, said, oh, no, that's racist, we can't do that. I know, exactly. What about, so, what about what about civil liberties considerations, you know, the right to freedom of expression, that you can wear a dopey hat or a, a nice little crocheted embroidered patch on the back of your leather jacket? Isn't there some civil liberties expectations there that everybody has a right to do those things? Speaking to the wrong person for an opinion on that. That's why I'm asking Unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> you better ask someone else. I'm, I'm not woke. <laughs> no, I don't believe. I mean, I, I I put this to Lindley. I said to her, if you're not a member, a contributing member of society, and being law abiding, and all those other sorts of things that go with being living in a civil society, then can't, haven't you abrogated your your rights uh, to be treated like an ordinary citizen? And if you're a criminal and you're wearing a uniform of a criminal, because uh, that's basically what it is. These gangs are just creating uniforms. They're not like the Boy Scouts or Girl Guides or whatever they call them these days who are doing actually good things. These people are criminals and they're doing bad things. And haven't they abrogated their right to be able to wear what they please? Absolutely. I'm 100% with you on that. <laughs> <laughs> but it, this is just treating a symptom, though, isn't it? We need to have a more systemic... Um, approach to crime fighting rather than just taking off their patches? No, destroying their motorbikes is the best thing because yeah. that sort of tracks all the youngsters, all the uh, bling and so forth. Get rid of it. Well, they systematically Harley Davidson remove really themselves from the... to sell more. Yeah, well, I mean, the thing is they ride Harley-Davidson's and those things don't go around corners, so they, they tend to remove themselves from the gene pool eventually. Yes, but not quick enough. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we need to put something in the petrol then. Like what? <laughs> Diesel? <laughs> I don't know. An explosive? Yeah, that'd be good. Yeah, yeah I've got control. no time for any of them. Yeah, I'm sorry. I've got no time for gang members at all. Yeah, they, they don't add anything to society, do they? Yep. Get they do, Willie they do tell us. Now he's retired. And a, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Get Willie Appiata now he's retired and a couple of his mates and second them to the police. They only need about three of them to deal with every gang member in the whole of New Zealand. They're all there's, just gone. There's and you nine, wouldn't even know where. Yeah, there's 9,000 gang members, but I reckon if you just said to some of those boys or maybe get some you know, Chechen mercenaries or something like that, fly them in, give them three names each, and um, sort it out over a weekend. Yeah, it wouldn't be a fair sort of match, would it? Well, I mean, the, the gang members have all got guns, but whether they can use them is another matter. Um, against the SAS, that would be useless. Yeah. They'd be gone in a flash if they had the authority to do it. Yeah. Instead, we sit there and go, oh, but they were breastfed. Oh, but they they didn't get enough um, uh, love and attention when they were children. Oh, you know, we need to understand that it's because of colonialism. Oh, and then whatever the next excuse is. Yeah, well, you and I both don't subscribe to that, so... There no. you are. 
No, and neither does this government, and that's what a lot of these screaming Herodans out there uh, who are caterwauling about, you know, pr um, protecting the rights of the criminal, uh, they don't understand that the vast majority of New Zealanders want to see criminals in prison uh, and their assets taken and them smashed. And we don't Well, death would be preferable. Be cheaper. Prison, you have to keep paying them money. Well, they, may, well, they should make them work, you know, actually bring back hard labour or even medium labour or any labour at I all. I want to see chain gangs. <laughs> chain gangs on the side of the motorway would be a good sight as you're just crawling past at 5Ks an hour, the average speed on the southern motorway. And they can all wear pink, um, you know, jumpsuits or something something yes. suitably yes. Um, yes. You know, terrible uh, with little arrows on them. Yes. It'd, be better, it'd be a better view than the orange road cones, wouldn't it? That'd be wonderful. Well, there's a thought. What about it's never going to happen, road, of course, road, pipe dreams, but it would be wonderful. We could use them as road cones, maybe. We could. We could. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we've been, we'll get in trouble, yeah. um, uh, Jack, if we keep on this track. Uh, I'll get the – my producer will be uh, you know, giving me the cutthroat signal, you know, cut it off. You can't, you can't say these things. Well, anyway, well, he was saying he... what people think. I know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, Jack, thanks for your contribution this week, and we'll talk again next week. See you later. See you. See you. Welcome to Cam's Buddies, Jimmy. G'day, Cameron. How are you this week? I'm, I'm giving you the same answer I give every week. I'm fantastic, even if I'm not. I'm fantastic. <laughs> now, what's your topic this week, mate? Right. So you might have seen the government has moved to ban gang patches, and I'm just wondering whether you think that'll work, whether it won't. Uh, what are the civil liberties implications, and do we care? I think it's fantastic. I certainly hope it works. It seems to have worked in Australia because all the gangs have moved into the ACT where there's all the woke liberals who yeah. won't implement that law. And I just think it'll be a, a matter of the police implementing the law properly, having the stones to do it. Well, they need you know? to get a new commissioner who's actually going to do some policing I mean, I'm, I've heard that within the police ranks, um, Costa is known as the lantern. He's very bright, but it has to be carried. <laughs> I have heard the same thing. But I think that the patch, you know, any criminal enterprise should be illegal to associate together. These gangs aren't businesses. They're, they're dealing serious drugs. You know, we've got a serious meth problem, and it's all fueled by the gangs, whether they're the 501s or whether they're localised. It doesn't matter. They should be targeted and harassed, and life should be made really hard for them. If you don't pay your tax bill, your life gets made really hard for you by the IRD. Why should the yeah. gangs have any different in terms of they'd need to be harassed by the state? This, how come lefties don't care about people getting harassed by IRD, but they care so much about the police har harassing people to deal meth? Yeah. Make it make sense, Cameron. Yeah, that's... So, what about what about uh, what did you see what Nashi did throwing Labour um, ministers under the bus and he wanted to uh, toughen up the uh, yeah the asset seizures uh, instead of having a thirty thousand dollar limit on how much they could have he wanted it set at zero so you could take everything off them and uh, Kerry Allen opposed that and said that uh, it'd be racist we can't do that and his answer to them to her was. Well, we're not actually specifying the race of people. We're saying that if criminals do this, we'll take their assets. And then Hipkins back to Kerry Allen. Yeah, because he's woke. She's a woke. She's in front of the well, due in court for other stuff. I mean, good on Nashi for being brave enough to speak out. I mean, what what the hell's it got to do with race? It's about being a criminal. Yeah, it doesn't matter what the race of the criminal is if you're dealing meth. Particularly if it's Maori gang members dealing with to marry kids. I mean, it's even more horrendous, you know? So, good on Nashi. And that's why he didn't really fit into the new Labour, because he was just a, a bit non woke. Yeah. He still he confiscated our guns, him. though. You know, so I don't have a lot of uh, sympathy for Nashi, to be fair. Cause, because, I mean, he, he took, the gun, took guns off law abiding citizens, didn't take any off the gang members. No, I, I agree with you on that. Like that was just, it was just a massive re reaction to you know a huge tragedy. You know, and that's just politicians earning points. Well, you know, when they can without actually thinking about the the reality of things. But oh, 
we we need to get hard on gangs. I mean, I, I, I've been around Auckland for a long time, and I never used to see them. And now I see them almost daily. And they're at the cafe, and you know they're mixing with the locals. It's, it just shouldn't be accepted that these people live off misery. The um, you know, they do was, a little bit of. You know, I asked Lindley about whether she thought the castle doctrine, having castle doctrine laws, would be useful for combating crime, and and she didn't know what that was. You know what castle doctrine is, don't you? Yes, I do. It's very good law in Texas, mate, and it seems to work quite well there. And in Florida. So, yeah, the two, of course do, it's in do, Florida. Do we, but, do, we, do we need to have that here? Do you think that we should have the right to defend our castle using whatever means necessary? If someone's on our property, in our property, that we have the right to defend ourselves any way that we see fit? I agree with it in principle, but there is a lot of loose cannons out there. What about people who are going to shoot some people that are lost or, you know, like, look, I, it's a very complicated problem there. Mm. But if, if someone's breaking into your property and being aggressive and your life's in danger, then you should be able to defend yourself. Without, sure. without fear of prosecution from the police who decided that all of a sudden the criminal who was trying to get at you is the innocent party and you're the bad guy because you stopped him. Yeah, well, that's just absolute madness. I, I just don't know how that came about. I mean, that's just mad. But you know, we're you know we've seen horrendous break-in crimes, you know, particularly on farmers' land and you know rural parts of New Zealand, Taranaki, and that. And and, and they should be able to defend themselves because the cops can't get there. It's just it just should have quite, I guess, have a clear criteria of um, mm. Mm. how it gets prescribed. But well, but maybe, yeah, so the game should apply like, to rural areas first and see how we go with that. And if it works, then we can start moving it in inwards towards the centre of each city. <laughs> well, you know, you know, which suburbs would get all the woke suburbs would get burgled, mate. Cause there'd be no guns there. Yeah. Well, that's what happened in the US. The, yeah, that's the right. Crimson started targeting um, where they knew there wouldn't be guns. Yeah, I mean that's why so, that's why people go and shoot up schools in the United States because all the woke school teachers. Said, declared every school a gun-free zone, and the criminals went, woohoo, cool, I can go and shoot up a school, I'm not going to get anybody shooting back at me. Well, I don't know, it's pretty crazy to go and shoot up a school. I think there's probably quite a few mental health issues to deal with in the US. And Absolutely, but they're everywhere. But here's the thing, right? Nobody has ever shot up a gun range. Why is that? <laughs> Uh, there's been a few shots gone off in the gun range, mate. I've seen people get suspended before. Oh, yeah, I've seen somebody shoot themselves at a, fire. at a gun range. It was not pleasant <laughs> for him. <laughs> no, there were people watching probably. So, um, yeah. Mm. Anyway, that's uh, we've, wrote, we've wandered off the topic, Cameron. Well, isn't it just a symptom of the frustration that people are experiencing in society, that we have we seem to have a woke police force that's more concerned about whether they have a rainbow tick or their police cars have rainbow stripes on them rather than actually going around and, and using the end of a PR24 baton to sort out um, a few gang members by cracking some skulls. I saw John Minto got one on the head the other day. I was quite impressed with that. Oh, dear. The, um... How sad. No, <laughs> <I'm not. laughs> hey, um... Uh, well, I'm going off topic, mate. I must be. I must say, Luxon's gone a little bit woke of late. He's wobbly, isn't he? He he was. He looked really good at the start there, but now he's trying to appease the woke. They'll never vote for him. So, what's he up to? I don't know, but he stood up to the media the other day when that uh, guy at uh, at Stuff, Glenn McConnell, was having a whinge about government ministers coming on uh, reality check radio shows, and he was having a big conniption about it. And, Luxon said, oh, we, we'll, we'll speak to anybody. And I, I thought that was pretty good. I, I thought what I'll do is I'll give him a call and say, when are you coming on my show now? We'll put in a booking, mate. The, um, yeah, I think the, the meet, like, I think the politicians sort of go through stages of being scared of the media, and then I guess there's other points where they just think it's just too pathetic and, and bite back. There's, I mean, my view is that politicians should be scared of the media, no matter who they are. They should be scared of them. Because the the media are going to hold them to account, and uh, make sure that their feet are held to the fire and they honour their promises. That's if we had a decent media that would actually do that. that and you, ask the hard you're talking questions. about the old media, not the one that's going to 
you know, miss, tr- twist the truth into some bullshit and then have a headline that's totally misleading and then end up calling them racist or something when it, it's clearly not. Yeah, that, that's mean, what they're scared of. Exactly. You know, they're scared that someone will be offended. You know, you and I aren't afraid of offending people. We do it all the time on a daily occurrence, <laughs> hourly even. <laughs> It's just what we do. Well, I have been encouraging people around me to speak their mind. I know, I know people just hold their tongues at, you know, certainly academic things and um, other, uh, you know, like work events, and, and they just go along because they just don't want to cause a, the, you know, they go the along. Scene, to get, we, they go along to get along. Yeah, but if, if everyone just sort of started speaking against it, and then a few more people might join in, and then we, we actually see that the emperor doesn't have any clothes on and we get back to a normal functioning society. Yeah, exactly. We need some more sensibleness yeah. uh, happening out there. We just need people to be more truthful and because and, and, most people don't agree with it. Look, look at the last election. Well, the left hasn't seemed to grasp that yet, have party. they? Hey? The left hasn't grasped that they lost the election. They, In a battle of ideas, they had dumb ones. <laughs> Yeah, they lost, and they lost comprehensively, and they're still losing more ground, and they just aren't accepting it, and they're just thinking everyone else is stupid. It's <laughs> uh, it's good times. Oh, well, if, anyway. what we, should do is we should have Cam's buddies in charge, not the Wombles that are currently there. <laughs> oh, the current lot who are currently in power, I'm reasonably happy, mate. I'm, I'm happier than I was a year ago. Yeah. Well, at least we can speak our mind and not worry about it these days. You know, before when the Ardernists were in charge, you worried about the Stasi coming and kicking in your door because you said something about, you know, some rainbow person who, who's got some strange <laughs> pronouns. You weren't allowed to, you know, that was death by firing squad no, if you insulted them. I've been watching a few videos on X of Arden's little rants about keeping people in isolation longer if they don't take a test. or mm-hmm. I was just thinking how close we were to such an awful situation. No, no, we weren't close yeah. to it. We were in a, an awful situation where rights were ignored and overridden and laws were broken by the people who should know better. Yeah, know? And, and, and the media all wonderful. toadied along with it. Well, she paid them. <laughs> I mean, they literally – I mean, I used to use a term – uh, you know, back in the day, calling people lick spittles. Well, that's what the media became. They became lick spittles of the Ardern regime. You know, if she said, um, I'd like you to jump over there, they'd say, oh, how far far would you like me to jump? <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank goodness that time period's over, mate. That was terrible. It's the yeah. worst. Well, we shouldn't I'm, even I'm let really... them forget it. I, I think a, a lot of people are super angry and, and it's going to take a long time to forget. And I think... A lot of the current politicians who are in that government will have to retire and go and do other jobs because people just won't forgive them no. for a long time. A good long time. Anyway. All right. Thanks for your call, Jimmy. Good I'll talk to you next thanks, week. Mate. Welcome to Cam's Buddies, Paul. Uh, hi. How are you this day? Yeah, pretty good, actually. Uh, you know, boxing on. That's the story. Now, I've got a What's question. today's topic? Today's topic, um, you might have seen a couple of stories. One is uh, uh, about the government uh, moving to ban gang patches and whether that will work or not. And uh, the other one is uh, Stuart Nash coming out and throwing his former Labour buddies under the bus saying, well, I tried to do all these things to stop crime and they didn't want to do it. Right. Well, um, the the gang patches is very interesting to me because I know that um, I was – watching an article on the television, not that all truth comes from the television, but they were talking about how the gangs would take them on and tell the police who's who. And some of the places um, down on the the east coast there seem to have like five police officers and 500 gang members or 1,200 gang members. So it's very hard for these things to go. But I think if the, um, the police were able to conscript the, conscript the army to come in and then um, ceremonially, ceremonially take a number of these patches off these fellows, I think that would be a really, um, really interesting thing. I know to some extent um, 
at one of the gyms I used to attend, um, one of the, the officials there said no no patches in the gym. And so anybody that came to the gym left their patches in the car outside somewhere else. So everybody just looked like they were normal citizens, not one group trying, trying to intimidate another. Yeah. I mean, you know, you're not someone who's, who can be intimidated too by gang members either, just quietly. Well, I don't like to... I, I am scared of being scared, so I really um, like to front up if anything's going wrong. But I'm not to say that, you know, these things aren't a little troublesome, but I've always thought, well, normally if, if you can face people down as individuals, um, if they've got an issue, it's quite amazing how all sorts of people that have all sorts of... Um, Caution. Things that would actually think you'd be, um, you sort of, all these intimidation things to think they're tough. One on one, they're not that tough. They often are just normal people, like I'm yeah. a normal person. Yeah, one on one, um, they're not that tough. And you and I have got some good experience on that. Stories that will probably curl a few people's toes in here um, if they heard them. But our experience is that they're actually not that tough uh, when you're one on one with them. Uh, when they're p- playing oh. up a big, a big um, in front of a group, well, it's a different story. But again, um, you can you can counter that a little bit. And I had different people from um, the Black Power working for me at one stage, and unbeknownst to me, they had reasonable ranking if such a thing occurs, that they were of a higher rank. And so mm. people would come into um, work and start threatening me, and next thing you know, one of my staff, who I thought was just um, a just one of the foremen on one of the jobs, goes over and has a word with them, and the bloke looked terrified and <laughs> moved on, and he said he won't bother you again. And I thought, very interesting. Mm. They, were, they were pretty good blokes, those guys who were working on the tools then. Oh, they, they were all hard-working, reasonable Kiwis is what I thought, and um, some of them had made a few mistakes in life, and many of them had, for some reason, thought it was a good idea to tattoo themselves on the face. It definitely slows your employment opportunities, but um, they they were, when working, when working one-on-one, when talking to me or any other respectful, good sort of citizens is what I thought. Um, But I think this idea, if the government has the ability to pull it off, they will need to raise the police force or, or have a lot of backing for them because I don't think people are going to go down and just say, oh, yeah, that's a, that's a non-event. And um, I saw also that they were taking some of these motorcycles and crushing them. I think that was quite a spectacle. And I think many people cheered on thinking, I wonder how people who don't work for a living can afford a fifty to to $100,000 motorcycle. Yeah, I mean, the, the, I always joke that Harley Davidsons are like the Remington rifles of the motorcycle world. You you, you get a standard one, uh, you know, off the rack, and it's of no use to man or beast, and you have to spend a, quite a considerable amount of money making them work properly. Um, you're not a fan of Harley Davidsons either, are you? I am not. I um, there was a number of motorbikes that were that I had that I've owned from new that were a Japanese knockoff of a Harley, except. Being a knockoff of a Harley, they did everything correctly. Like they had a overhead um, cam motor as opposed to a push rod. They had um, fluid cooled. They had drive shaft. All these things they, they performed better. Cars. They Isn't had it? yes. <laughs> if you if you were to lay it down, you could lay it down. Like I scraped the pegs a number of times on on such a bike, and it was um and it stayed with you. And if you tried to drive off with the stand down, um it would the engine would cut out so that whereas a lot of Harleys just keep driving and then as they turn the corner for whatever reason it throws the rider and causes them a mischief oh dear how sad never mind <laughs> yeah, so, yes so and you... as far as um, yeah. I think um, Stuart Nash was one of the most ineffective ministers I think I've ever seen I think he he had high hopes and um, but in the reality and the enacting of what he did, he just proved that he was little or nothing here, nothing to see here. Yeah, he, he thought he was all that in a bag of chips, and turns out he wasn't. Well, I found it amusing at different times. Like, he he didn't know when it was the right time to be a... Uh, like, his 
vitriol when he had some speech after the winning of the um, a couple of elections back. It just went down like a lead balloon. I'm thinking, talk about can't read a room. The, the bloke was classic. Mm. Yeah, I thought he was pretty ineffectual, and what he did to um, shooters uh, and confiscation of firearms was pretty appalling because the gangs never handed back their guns. That's the one thing that the government was said about was criminalising law-abiding licensed firearms owners while at the same time cuddling up to the criminals like the mongrel mob. Yes, well, it's um, interesting that there's some tiny homes that I'm involved with and people are saying, take them up north and sell them to people on Maori land. They don't need a building permit. And I'm mm. thinking, how is it possible that they don't need a building permit? No building inspector dares go up and have a look at what they're doing. Talk, talk about a rule for law-abiding citizens and a rule for unlaw abiding citizens, it's sort of a bit interesting. And a number of police have been interviewed and said, would you, um, would you give a gang member a, um, a ticket for driving recklessly or doing this, whatever, on the road? And they say, no, and when they get back to the station, my understanding is they get mocked. Because if they were to give them a ticket, first of all, the what's the guy's real address? So you're going to spend a lot of time trying to find the actual person who did the offence. Then he's not going to pay his fine. And when he doesn't pay his fine, you're going to spend more time chasing after him to get the money out of him. And if you happen to go there, and this is all assuming that when you stopped him in the first place, you didn't get yourself a hiding. And so if there's a group of lawless people who act in a manner however they like, and then the police think it's no problem to ticket a 70-year-old man or woman because they're not going to give them any trouble. This is not the society that I grew up in. This is not how I think it should work. I think that it's one law for all, and if someone offends, then we get sufficient police to go and sort out whatever the problem is. Yeah, and if we've got politicians that have got a bit of metal, a bit of spine, a bit of backbone, that don't cave in to the woke you know, caterwauling about... Um, whether or not it's racist or not, then we might get somewhere. And maybe the the gang patch ban is a a good start. Um, but it's that's all it is is a good start. I think it's a good start, and and to actually get offenders off the street, I think is a much better thing. And if it causes them to offend um, when you're trying to take their patch off them, then were they guilty of the offence, or did you, as the police, cause the offence? And so I think that we'll end up with some quite interesting um, judicial cases if this does happen, yeah. because who caused the crime? Was it the was it the um, gang member or was it the police officer trying to take the gang member's property for whatever reason, whether it's legal or illegal? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, talking with Lindley, we we came up with the conclusion that this was just a good start and we need to actually start addressing some issues around responsibility, personal responsibility, those sorts of things. And she mentioned the Man Up program and I thought that that's what the government should be doing. They should actually go and sit down with Brian Tamaki and say, right, how can we get Man Up into the prison so we can break the cycle? Sure, we can take their gang patches off them, we can put them in prison when they commit a crime, but what happens next? And uh, to my mind, the only thing that, that has got any proven track record, is the Man Up program. Well, um, Brian, if you talk to him, and I have a couple of times, seems like he's really got the best interest of the families at heart. Mm. And the big thing about joining a gang is the breakdown of the family unit. And so if mum and dad are together at home, as a family unit, they bring up good kids. If there's mum at home and or dad at home and there's no male role models that are examples of how to behave, then the young men look for something that is inclusive and a gang is. And so by not addressing the problem of broken families or single parent families, you're actually causing um, it becomes a breeding ground. When the state is acting as your parent, um, then this is a breeding ground for antisocial behaviour. And so even a, a bad dad's better than no dad often. And I'm not mm. saying women should stay there and, and take beatings, but I'm thinking that sometimes we don't try hard enough to keep the family together. 
yeah. when the family breaks down, that's when we have people running off the rails, and then we have young people who get themselves into trouble. Then, have, then, then they get attracted to the yeah. gangs, and then it's a, a cycle to downwards to prison. Yes. Well, and I'll that's think... the sort of thing that, like, just um, just recently, I think um, uh, someone I know very closely was stood down from school. And, and as such, what occurred with his stand down is hero status. And so when you see um, young people who are committing petty crimes of sort and they get hero status amongst their peers, then suddenly they want to escalate to get more of the same accolades possibly as, as young men. And I'm thinking we need to work out a system whereby if you've done wrong at school and you're punished, you don't come out of it being a hero, you come out of it being um, somewhat contrite for your poor mm. behaviour. Yeah, exactly. I hear you. I, I think, um, you know... Having said that, well, having said that, I think some of the schools are so woke that you get punished for things that, in my day, were was a discussion and now it's considered... Um, a playground fight, whereas when, when there, if you would have to put gloves and put a ring around it, then we could have sorted out some differences with the young men letting off a bit of steam and, and getting rid of a bit of their testosterone or, or using it productively. But now anything like that, because of the um, video phones and all that, it goes online and suddenly the school's embarrassed and next thing you know, um, everybody's getting stood down or suspended or whatever because and suddenly you've got people who um, aren't learning the finer points of the male hierarchy. No, that's right. I mean, when I was at school, there was definitely a pecking order. And um, if, you, hmm. if you fell foul of that, uh, excuse the joke, but uh, if you fell foul of that, you certainly got... Um, Disabused of your um uh, of your notions of above your actual status, very quickly. Exactly. And, but and, nowadays and they call that everyone bullying. knew where they were going. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know? I, I I don't know if it's actually bullying because in life we learn the same things with our intellect, and who, whoever makes the most money at the end kind of wins. So he gets or she gets people working for them, doing things for them, um, for money. And, and it's, we've, we've sort of lost the competition factor and we've lost entrepreneurial behavior and um, we've lost the work ethic. And I'm just looking and thinking, is it any wonder that folk are resorting to gangs? And when they get there, um, it's like a family. It, it's like someone who will use a code. You don't, uh, mess up against the code, or you'll you'll get dealt to in one manner or another. And mm. so, all the things that were the discipline that were lacking in the home and normal discipline in the schools, the gangs seem to have it. And and you sort of think this is a little bit topsy turvy. Yeah, it is. As I said to said to uh, Lindley, it's ass backwards. But uh, you know, maybe <laughs> Christopher Luxon should should get Cam's buddies all together, and we'll solve all these problems. We could give him a couple of coaching efforts. Exactly. All right, Paul, thank you for your call, and I'll talk to you next week. Thank you. Bye for now. Bye. Welcome to Cam's Buddies, Miles. Good afternoon, Cam. How are you? Yeah, good. Box of birds. Everything's fantastic. Excellent. I'm, I'm having a few chortles and laughs at, at the other buddies coming up with uh, solutions for crime and things like that, and that's what we want to talk about today. The government's got uh, uh, an announcement this week that they're going to start uh, passing legislation to uh, start taking gang patches off gang members. And at the same time, we've had uh, Stuart Nash throwing his Labour uh, minister, fellow Labour ministers back when they were in government, under the bus saying, well, I tried to do this sort of thing and they told me I was racist. What are, you, what are your thoughts on those two things? Well, uh, you know, I find myself laughing um because if you look at what Goldsmith said, we need to take action to reduce the gang's ability to engage in criminal behaviour and mm -hmm. prevent them from endangering and intimidating Kiwis. Good Lord, they're going to do that by, oh, what? Oh, you can't wear your gang patch in public. Gosh, that'll stop them. 
I can think that that'll just call a complete halt. No, I think they're um, the devil's going to be in the details, but I think they're barking up the wrong tree. Sure, it sounds good, but um, just imagine if the uh, the detail meant that uh, listeners wearing their RCR T-shirt, that insignia was considered a gang because of some quirk in the law. Uh, I mean, that would just be horrific. And, uh, you know, this sort of thing where insignias can be banned is is a, a sorry path that we're treading, I, I feel. Well, we had um, Jack earlier and Paul uh, earlier who suggested that perhaps we should utilise another gang that wear uh, green and tan and, and boots and things like that and carry sort of long black things and get them to sort them out. And, and Jack suggested that we might actually deploy the SAS in a more effective manner to deal with these gang members. And there's 9,000 gang members, and he reckons that that the squadron could probably go through them in about 10 minutes. Oh, I think 9.3 minutes, but, yeah, uh, it's fine. I think here we are debating gang insignia, and I think it's a, it's a stupid law, but I'll have to say one thing. You look at what they're planning to do, police issue dispersal notices, <laughs> which will require gang members to leave the area and not associate with each other for seven days. I mean, that's laughable. These people are criminals. The first yeah. thing they're going to do is go, oh, well, we've been kicked out of here. We'll get round at the bro's place. They won't be listening to that. Well, they'll I mean, just, they'll just, just saunter away and um, laugh in the police's face. Uh, yeah, thumb, thumb their nose at the courts, who are going to issue non-consent consorting orders, which will stop gang offenders from associating or communicating with one another for up to three years. Have these idiots not heard of the digital revolution? I, I doubt very, very much whether um, known criminals will actually follow a court. Well, they don't. <laughs> I mean, that, that's the thing. I mean, this is the thing that, that it's the same with gun laws, right? They, they pass all these laws and they say this is going to stop crime. No, it won't, because criminals well, don't follow the law. Well, it's interesting that Mr. Goldsmith, in his in his press release about the magical effect of banning banning an insignia, I'm sorry, banning an insignia, says that there's been a significant escalation in gang related violence, public intimidation, and shootings. How could how could there be an escalation of shootings? We've got the Firearms Safety Authority. You know, their their mission is in their name, firearm safety. Oh, oh, that's right. It's only for the law abiding. <laughs> well, what I've found with firearms, if you leave them alone, they don't leap off the desk and run around and do terrible things, right? They, they just don't. Correct. <laughs> Correct. You know, it's people but, that are the problem. I mean, I, okay, look, I've had a bit of a laugh at the law, the, the proposed law, but... Actually, um, there is one thing that I quite like about it. The law will also be changed to give greater weight to gang membership as an aggravating factor well, that's of sentencing. That's a good idea. Yeah, agree with I that. I think that's a great idea. I mean, hallelujah. Shouldn't it, it be called the aggravated, uh, aggravated um, factor? And shouldn't the courts say, if you're a gang member, you add three years to your um, sentence non-negotiable no matter what. And uh, very quickly we'd see the the, the judges, and, and really I, I don't have a hell of a lot of respect for judges. I think the judges and the police have, have strayed down the woke road and we're seeing some very, how should I say, biased judges and biased policing, and, and I'm not happy about that at all. But if there was a law that said no matter what, if you're a gang member you get an extra three years, well, yeah, so be it. But here's my solution. Hey, we've got all these laws and, and they already exist. Why don't the police enforce them? What What's wrong with the police? <laughs> Chance would be a fine thing. Well, I mean, look at it this way. If the National wanted to get tough on gangs, 
just to clear the uh, domestic terrorist organisation. Well, that's what Winston be gone said by Monday. Election, that's what Winston said in the ele- in the election campaign to clear gangs of domestic terrorists, and uh, we can use the full weight of the terrorism laws against them, which would include using the SAS. And and they'd be gone by Monday. I mean, but instead we get these ludicrous reports from the press of gang members. I don't know, queuing up at tattoo parlours to get their gang insignia tattooed on their head or, or whichever part of their anatomy they're going to display in public. Have these I mean, guys not I'm heard just... of belt sanders and angle grinders? <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, nothing so serious, but it's, it gets laughable. I mean, and, you know, human beings, by their very nature, are quite uh, um, interested in laws. And who's to say that the new gang insignia for gang XYZ isn't a, a blue New York Yankees cap or woe betide some other American um, Chicago's, Chicago uh, football Bulls team or cap? Similar. Yeah, yeah, Basketball, yeah. So uh, if you're, if you're, the, yeah, I don't know. But you know, they they could switch in a second from having. Uh, I don't know, a big rondel they'll, they'll saying... Just change um, from, they'll just change from insignia to colours. That's what they'll do. And you, ca- you can't legislate against colours. Yeah, imagine that. Otherwise, Granny would be going down to the supermarket in the blue dress and, and that'd be it. She'd be in the slammer because the police sure as hell wouldn't want to arrest that big dude over there dressed in blue. But Granny, she looks like she's she looks, she a gang looks like member. She, yeah, Off she, she looks goes. subversive. She looks very subversive. <laughs> Anyway, Miles, I don't think okay. we're going to solve this problem, but thanks for calling, and we'll talk next week. Indeed. We'll see you next week, Cam. Bye. Okay. Gosh, my buddies are awesome. I'm so blessed to have such a great bunch of mates and new buddies to share anything with. They're so wise and speak common sense, except occasionally Jack loses the plot. But, hey, that's why we love him. Time now for the mailbag. We've got a, some long ones here, but very informative. Some general feedback from Andrew. Great show, Cam. I've never listened to it before, but thoroughly entertaining and informative. I've got an anonymous comment here about my monologue about the ENS New Zealand Defence Force mandate debacle. Cam, I was a civilian who was forced out of the Defence Force and would describe their attitude to be reflective of a deep-seated problem that they have failed to address in op respect and institutionalised bullying. Now, my Gary Moller interview has got a lot of comments. Cam, if you don't already know about vitamin B3, you'll likely find it very interesting, and that's from Graham. And he adds a PS. Uh, I'm sure you know that you did not have a stroke due to a deficiency of any drug. Actually, I did. Uh, I have a deficiency of potassium. 95% of people who have strokes have a deficiency outside the normal range of potassium, and I'm one of those people. Beth adds, Gary provided so much invaluable information today. Cam, another national treasure. Good job. Uh, Another anonymous comment says, I love my greens, especially kale. Sorry, Cam and Gary. And Koru says, Cam, for me, that was a God-given message. i just awoken and declared that I wished to attract to my day all that was needed for me to experience the good and that I could go into the day on the path to higher knowledge. I turned on RCR Radio and got your discussion. I'm not mind-blown as being a background in natural ways of living. I understood much of the discussion. I know I was meant to hear of your path back to health, and Gary will be hearing from me for analysis. I wish you strength and perseverance to get fully healthy and off those drugs, particularly the statins. And I've got another anonymous comment here. Hi, I've just listened to some of the crunch and didn't manage to hear what Gary's last name or website was. Can you let me know? He was very good. He is very good. His last name is Moller. So that's Gary Moller, M-O-L-L-E-R. And his website is Precision Health Testing. Dot com. Bruce says, Cam, I was on Citalopram for a few years, years ago, and it took me a year to get off it properly, not the month or two the doctor said. I shaved a bit off every two weeks, so it was out of my system completely after about a year. NAC or NAC is brilliant, help eliminate a persistent cough after a cold. 
And my good mate Mike from Foxton writes, Cam loved the show with Gary Moller. He's a real Kiwi treasure, this man, and maybe he could be headhunted by the government to be involved with the health system. A quiet word to Mr. Peters over a whiskey and cigar with you may help. After listening, I'm convinced and I'm going to start the citrus drink as soon as I get the ingredients sorted. Anyway, Gary mentioned statins in your chat and my senses pricked up immediately because my mother was put on statins before she died. And I noticed straight away a change in her from mood to fitness and even worse, just general health. I have since watched a few video docos about statins and the best one is by an Australian journo and rheumatologist, Dr. Marianne DeMarcy. This is 50 odd minutes of jaw-dropping fact and an eye-opening report on what Big Pharma are prepared to do to make money and silence people. I also heard you mention that you were keen on venison. My nephew Matt said to let you know he's working for some crowd here in New Zealand and would love to talk to you about taking you out hunting. I'm all ears, Mike. Really am. I love hunting. If I were you, though, don't pay for that. I never pay for hunting. Got a mate who has a bit of building experience and take him with you to Matt's house and do a couple of days building work and even plastering. Matt will then take you out the back of his property and you can shoot as many deer as you can carry. Just ask my mate Chris from Foxton. He shot one just after Christmas, said it was the fattest and nicest venison he has ever had. Matt's place is teeming with deer at the moment. So glad to hear that your new journey with the healthy food is working. I'm going to save some money and get Gary to do a hair follicle test for me so I can get my health back on track again. You're both an inspiration, and thank you for that, Mike from Foxton. Sal and Jack say, hi, team. So great to have you all back. Hope you all had a deserved break, and now you're back for the year. Hubby Jack and I are engrossed in all your interviews and discussions. There have been so many gems since you started back but I did want to say how interesting the interview was with Gary Moller and Cam. We certainly look forward to seeing how Cam gets on. I, for one, have got in touch with Gary since that interview and couldn't believe it when Gary personally rang me. What a refreshing change that was. So I'm going to look into an issue with Gary and see if I can also get some answers. Keep up the great work, RCR. You're also very much appreciated. Big hugs. And Bronwyn sends me an email, says, Hi, Cam. It was great to hear your follow-up with Gary. I had hair testing done with him after your first chat last year. My issues are different to yours, but I feel like I'm finally on the right track with Gary after trying many other treatments and practitioners. I'm also liking Lindley. She's my kind of woman. I was intrigued to hear she's from Marlborough like me. It's a small province, and I can't help wondering if I've met her. I was just as sad as you were to hear what Robbo's policies did to her husband. P.S. What kind of drugs is Jack taking? Uh, on Facebook, Kim says, this was a great discussion and so much what I believe in. Could Cam say where he buys his black pudding from, please? I'm in Milford and need it for my heart iron. And that's from Kim. And we've sent a private message to Kim but for the benefit of other listeners, particularly those in Auckland, the Westmere Butchery makes the best black pudding in Auckland. But I'm willing to be challenged if people think they've got a better black pudding. Well, they can contact my producer or via email and arrange to send me a care package. Now, Cam's buddies on Grant Robertson's new job. Graham says, can I believe Robertson signed the Pfizer contract, which would be reasonably described as treason amongst his other credentials? God bless you, Lindley, sending you big hugs. Miles is just brilliant. And Joel says, first of all, I know Lindley, and she is an amazing woman. Thanks so much for giving her a voice. Something magical is happening in her life at the moment, as it is in many of ours. Synchronicity is at play. I bawled my eyes out when I listened to her letter to Grant and also when you realised that you were able to give her a platform. Thank you for doing what you do and providing a platform. I wonder if it's not already being done on RCR, it might be worth considering a show or segment to allow others to share their stories publicly. There's something healing in the process for the sharer, the listeners and hosts. Anyway, food for thought. And Julian emails about Morris Williamson, 
says, please ask Morris why we have an expenditure for a climate emergency when there is no such thing. That money could be better spent. It's a topic that we're working on in a hibiscus BFF group. So if Cam can follow up, if appropriate, maybe for more discussion over next month, that would be good and appreciated. And that's the mailbag for this week. That's it for the crunch this week. The topics we've explored so far are just the tip of the iceberg, and there's plenty more to boot. This year is going to be massive politically with the new government making inroads on delivering their promises. This week, it was attacking gangs and gang patches. I'm kind of hoping they go after media next. We'll be keeping a watching brief on US politics. And this week, Donald Trump trounced Nikki Haley in her own state. Trump won the South Carolina Republican primary by 20 points, grabbing 60% of the vote. Nikki Haley, as a result, has lost financial backers. And at the moment, she's keeping her fingers crossed for Super Tuesday, which is the first week of March. Shane Jones was on fire. I get the feel. He's a change man. He certainly seems to have a new fire in his belly. And I've observed him over many years, and he's a different person. And it was Annie O'Brien's first interview on RCR, and what an engaging woman she is. And yes, we're allowed to call her a woman, because she is. We traversed a few topics there, but you know me, I just like having a conversation with anyone. It's been a real pleasure having you all back again this week. I'm loving all your feedback, really enjoy talking to so many people, sharing their thoughts on politics, life, and everything in between. So a big shout out to all of you. Thank you for listening and having faith in me as we continue to explore this beautiful game of politics. Don't forget, email suggestions to inbox at realitycheck.radio. They can be suggestions for people to need to interview or some interesting topics. But we'll continue to make this show the best political show in New Zealand. I look forward to having you join me again next week for The Crunch with Cam Slater. You've been listening to The Crunch with Cam Slater. Remember, you can check out the replays for today's show on our website at www.realitycheck.radio forward slash replays. Tune in every Thursday at 4 p.m. for more with Cam Slater. Right here on RCR, Reality Check Radio.